All right, welcome everyone. This is the Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee meeting of Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. The time is 3.05 p.m. We are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. A quorum is present. Members, we have seven bills on the agenda. Uh, Hot one for sure, and I need to confer on another one, um, will be referred to other committees. Uh, otherwise, uh, the remainder um, are intended to be laid on the table for possible inclusion in our supplemental finance bill. And with that, we will start off with, oh, I have some uh, announcements to make. Uh, so we have a heavy agenda today. Uh, if testifiers who are with us, we're really happy you're here, but would love if you can keep your testimony to three minutes. We have a timer. Uh, and, uh, oh, yes, the math. If everyone keeps their testimony to three minutes, uh, we'll still have well in excess of an hour of testimony. We need to reserve time, of course, for committee questions and amendments and the like. Um, all right, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, and so we are going to start with Senator McEwen, who is here to present Senate File 4938. Welcome, Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members, it's my pleasure today to present to the committee Senate File 4938, um, which uh, is a zero emission transit buses tra transition provisions and appropriation. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have an A1 amendment I'd like to um, adopt at this point just to get the bill in the shape that I would like it to be in. Very good. So <laughs> Senator McEwen uh, moves the A1 amendment to Senate File 4938. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members, our transition to a clean energy future is well underway here in Minnesota, spurred in large part by the successes of last session. This bill continues that momentum by charting a path for Minnesota's transit buses to become zero emissions on a timeline that supports our state's overall climate goals while also cleaning up our air and increasing access to affordable and healthy transportation options for more Minnesotans. This bill, which covers transit buses across the state that carry more than 15 passengers, does two things. First, it provides funding for and direction to Met Council, MnDOT, and transit agencies across our state to create zero emission transit bus transition plans that show how transit fleets across the state could conceivably become wholly zero emissions. And two, it provides a starting milestone to get there by requiring all new transit bus purchases to be zero emissions starting in 2030. To meet our state's climate goals, we will need to make sure our transition to zero emissions buses is well underway by 2030. However, we know challenges still exist in the electric transit bus space today, some of which are outside transit agencies' control. Because of that, this bill also includes some flexibility, allowing transit agencies to seek an exemption from the MnDOT commissioner for meeting the 2030 purchase goal if barriers prove too great in the short term. Besides reducing transportation pollution and promoting access to affordable, healthy transportation, this bill may also spur more clean ec energy economic development here in Minnesota by providing a strong policy signal that Minnesota is a place to build these zero emissions buses. Given Minnesota is already home to one of the only electric transit bus manufacturers in the country, New Flyers of America, this bill could be an additional spark to growing local clean energy jobs, particularly in greater Minnesota. And members, with that, uh, I will... Um, that concludes my initial presentation, Mr. Great. Chair, and I'll, I'll stay here for questions. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, before we move to questions, why don't we go ahead and invite some people forward who have indicated they would like to provide some thoughts, some testimony on Senate File 4938. I have Anjali Baines and Sherry Munyon. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Wonderful. Thank you, Chair, Senator McEwen, and committee members. My name is Anjali Baines, and I am the Transportation Policy Lead at Fresh Energy, a clean energy advocacy nonprofit. I am here speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Clean Transportation, which supports Senate File 4938, 
Coalition members include Fresh Energy, Sierra Club, The Alliance, Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, Cure, and MN350. The Coalition has been advocating for more electric transit buses since our start in 2018 for reasons of health, climate, equity, access, and affordability. We are thrilled to see Senate File 4938 set a clear path for more electric transit buses across Minnesota. Electrifying our transit system is a matter of environmental justice. Black, Indigenous, and people of color, those with lower incomes, and people with disabilities represent the majority of transit riders. Many of these communities also experience the brunt of vehicle-related pollution. Reducing diesel pollution in these communities most burdened by air pollution and most reliant on transit is a critical step in reducing public health disparities across race and income in Minnesota. It's also worth noting that air pollution is not only a metro area issue. It affects all Minnesotans and is especially harmful to those outside the Twin Cities who are older and who don't have easy access to health care. Cleaning up our transit buses is a small but important step to making sure clean air, along with clean transportation, is accessible and affordable to more Minnesotans. Finally, as Senator McEwen and as the Communication Workers of America, the union representing new fire employees who are making electric buses right here in Minnesota, underscored in their written um, testimony, this bill will support more local clean energy jobs by demonstrating Minnesota is serious about electric transit buses and is a place to make them. For all these reasons, the Coalition for Clean Transportation supports this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Came right in under the wire, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Bunyan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My testimony, I will stay within the three minutes. It's actually longer, so I brought handouts uh, to share with the committee. I'm representing Sherry Minion, representing the Minnesota Public Transit Association, who seeks to work with our communities, large, small, urban, suburban, and rural, to serve our citizens in public transit. MIPTA appreciates the goal of cleaner buses and new investment in the transit industry and wants to work with the legislature in making this transition to zero emission buses as well as increasing access to transit across the state. In moving people to jobs, school, medical services, et cetera, public transit reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 33% less per passenger mile than an average single occupancy vehicle with just 28 seats occupied. And the reduction increases to 82% for a typical diesel transit bus when it's full with 40 passengers. We appreciate that the plan will explore a lot of issues, including potential barriers and constraints, the capacity of the electric grid, and staffing needs, all of which will be extremely helpful. In addition, the plan should evaluate increasing bus transit service across the state to reduce emissions. Transit systems and manufacturers must be involved as partners with agencies in the collaborative development of any transition plans, and we urge a longer implementation time. This bill provides for six-year lead time while California provided 12 years uh, for their timeline, and that was developed before the supply chain issues. Transit uh, systems are already behind in obtaining needed buses to replace their aging fleets, and the supply chain issues during COVID made it extremely difficult to obtain buses, still looking at 12 to 18 month delays and dramatic cost increases. MIPTA would like to underscore that the transition to zero emission buses involves more than the bus. As noted by the American Public Transit Association, it also includes charging, fueling, infrastructure, coordination with utilities and cities and employee training, requiring specific focus and a coordination, and consideration of the shorter lifespan of buses must be considered together with the increased operating costs that will be ongoing. Our understaffed small transit systems will struggle to deal with even the requirements of obtaining a waiver. Infrastructure outside the metropolitan area is scarce, mandating that transit agencies purchase zero emission vehicles in area where charging infrastructure and grid capacity has not reached a certain threshold is a recipe for new buses sitting in lots unused. Some of our transit systems have already been working on vehicle emission duction, but we also know that after more than five years of operating electric buses, that the batteries are, or that the buses are not a one-for-one -one exchange with a diesel bus 
nor do we see this being the case in the next seven to 10 years. Improved battery technology is incrementally increasing, but the range that these buses can operate in our client are not yet ready to be overcome. The diesel uh, buses where they will run from 4 a.m. to midnight without requiring fuel is compared to the six to eight hour operating deficit on a 10 degree Fahrenheit day for the new buses. Other factors are the adoption of charging infrastructure and their capacity. There have been persistent issues with our electric bus chargers and we, there have no, uh, ha we have not yet found alternatives that have long-term reliability ratings. We urge that the agency's task force bring back a collaborative report addressing all the many issues, including both startup funding and ongoing funding with a timeline for transitioning before goals are adopted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Munyon. I have uh, Tim Marino and then Judge Shetnan. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Marino. I'm a transit rider and advocate, and I oppose this mandate. While I support mandates for personal vehicles, the demands we require for our transit vehicles are fundamentally different. 58% of our statewide transportation emissions come from personal vehicles, while transit only accounts for 0.04% of our state's GHG emissions, while providing 54 million rides in 2018. How much more emissions would that produce if everyone who has taken transit ends up driving? How many more fatalities will happen on our roads because of car accidents? If we have reduced reliability from operations, it will also lead to people not trusting transit. We demand a lot from our buses. Sometimes they're out in the system for many hours and 300 miles per day. If a bus, bus breaks down, it can take a long time for a new driver to be found and a new bus to come out of the garage to relieve it. Meanwhile, everyone who is on that bus or waiting to board that bus is stuck. They can't get to their jobs, they can't get to any other obligations, and they lose trust in our system. Electric buses are not reliable. In 2019, Metro Transit launched the C-Line with battery electric buses. The C-Line had an average monthly availability of 71% compared to 89% for the diesel buses. They have had to respond to calls while they're out in service three times as often. They also require longer layoffs for uh, layovers for charging while they're out on the route, requiring 10% more operation, operators to provide the same level of service. We're already down 400 operators being understaffed since 2018. Do you want to be responsible for defunding transit by another 10%? The C line is also a shorter route due to limitations of the charging infrastructure. It only goes from Brooklyn Center to downtown, while the D line, that uses hybrid electric buses, is able to go twice the length from Brooklyn Center to Mall of America. Shorter routes require more transfers and longer trips for riders. One of the most frustrating things for me as a rider is I have to transfer if I'm going in the same direction. And as a network, we should be pushing for longer routes to serve deeper into the suburbs. Requiring zero emission buses will move us in the opposite direction. Currently, the Met Council has a plan for 20% of their vehicles to be zero emissions by 2027 and has zero emission plans that are already in process to be released every five years. That's a goal that's realistic, supported by staff, and Metro Transit is targeting implementation of those zero emission buses in places where there's high pollution and high pie pocket populations. They've added matter trap filters, which has resulted in a 96% reduction of particulate matter emissions, and diesel exhaust fluid, which results in a 94% of nitrous oxide emissions. They've rolled out hybrid electric buses on many routes too. We could also explore trolley buses, which have been used reliably for 80 years or longer in Seattle and San Francisco and other places. If we are providing accessible, reliable, fast, and frequent transit service to more people, it will have the greatest role in reducing Minnesota's GHG emissions by attracting people to transit, bicycling, and walking instead of driving their personal vehicles, relying on vehicles that have a higher rate of breakdown, and reducing service by needing more operators per routes does the opposite and pushes people into personal vehicles. I implore you to hold off on the zero emission bus plan and allow riders who make the choice to already reduce their emissions have a more reliable bus transportation system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marino. Uh, Mr. Shetner. Welcome to the committee. Great. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Judd Shetnan. I'm the Government Affairs Director at the Metropolitan Council. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide some comments on Senate File 40. 
938 and the Metropolitan Council, including Metro Transit and the Metropolitan Transportation Services appreciate Senator McEwen's efforts to support zero emission bus technology and its benefits. We too are committed to advancing zero emission bus service in our region. Uh, the Metropolitan Council developed a zero emission bus transition plan in February 22 and the Metropolitan Transportation Services um, developed our, those, their plans in April of 2023. And zero emission buses and the supporting technologies that enable them, including charging infrastructure and onboard batteries, have been maturing in the past decades with the pace of improvements in reliability and economies of scale accelerating in more recent years. Many transit agencies have had increasing interest in zero emission buses, but the commercial adoption of such technologies has not been widespread. The adoption of zero emission buses is affected by supporting infrastructure, as you've heard, uh, and supply chain constraints, electrical grid capacity, the rapid pace of zero emission bus innovation, and the limited production capacity in supporting infrastructure manufacturers. The Metropolitan Council's transition plan identified several objectives and strategies to address and mitigate the barriers and constraints with the transition to zero emission bus. As Metro Transit's experience and knowledge of this technology grows, these strategies and objectives will be continuously updated to reflect current best practices and lessons learned as additional experiences gained. With our current transition plans, the Council is committed to delivering environmentally sustainable transportation sources or choices that are safe, convenient, comfortable, and re reliable for our customers. Currently, we have eight battery electric buses in service on the Metro C line, and in February issued a notice to proceed with New Flyer for five battery electric buses to support the Metro Gold Line in 2025. Later this month, Metro Transit will advance two business items through the Council to purchase 20 more battery electric buses along with supporting infrastructure uh, for these buses. These purchases are made available uh, through the FTA and the no low emission grants that the Council received in recent years. Also this month, the Council will submit our 2024 no and low emission grant applications where we will seek an additional $90 million from the FTA to support uh, facilities and improvements for zero emission buses and purchase 35 more buses and support workforce development associated with this fleet transition. As the council continues to move forward with the transition to zero emission buses, it is important to establish milestones and performance measures to maximize the benefits to the region while staying true to the mission to provide more reliable service to customers. These milestones and performance measures are imperative to ensure a seamless transition to zero emission bus uh, buses for our customers and the guarantee of service. Our concern is a, our concern with the final transition date to January 1st, 2030 may not be sustainable with this new and emerging evolving technology and we recommend the continued monitoring and updating of our zero emission bus plan and this technology. We appreciate would like to continue to work with you. Just last month we had a number of stakeholders and advocates come over to our Haywood facility in Minneapolis to get an update on our commitment and where we're going with this. We'd be happy to provide that to to the committee and uh, thank you for granting me a couple extra seconds, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shetnan. Uh, would anyone else like to testify on Senate file? That. Yes, this, this Senate file. All right, seeing none, members, questions? Mr. Chair, I have a question for Mr. Shetnan, if he could. As long as you're up there, thank you. Uh, so you've been replacing some, what's the cost difference between an electric bus and an existing bus? approximately, just a ballpark number of the difference between the two. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Shetnan. Senator Jasinski, I'm actually gonna have one of our uh, folks from Metro Transit who works on this to give you the exact data. Brian Funk is here, hopefully he's on his way up and he can speak to that uh, in much more clearly than I would be. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Yeah, committee members, Brian Funk, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Metro Transit. And I would just say uh, in round numbers, the, the difference between those costs on a per unit basis is in the neighborhood of about a half million dollars is what our current experience is. So it, it varies slightly based on the length of the bus as well as any complicating factors with the infrastructure required for the charging, but uh, that's a, a round number that could be used. Mr. Senator so, Jasinski. Uh, so a half a million dollars difference per bus, and that doesn't include the charging and the things, the non-bus items as far as the infrastructure to support that bus, correct? Mr. Funk. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, so uh, that's correct. So uh, right now, for example, the notice to proceed we issued for the 60-foot buses to support Gold Line, uh, those vehicles are just under $2 million uh, versus 
um, you know, a, a comparable diesel bus uh, being a little bit more than a million, so. And Mr. Funk, uh, what, uh, what is the difference, either more or less, I don't even actually know the answer, maybe someone said so in testimony while I was distracted with other things, but um, uh, what is the difference in um, operating costs, gas and repairs and maintenance, that sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, so uh, we have experience with uh, the early generation 60-foot uh, buses that we've been operating since 2019. Uh, we've seen that the uh, battery electric buses so far have had a slightly higher operating cost. Uh, diesel has, of course, been a more variable uh, source of fuel, it's a little bit hard to, harder to budget for, but uh, the operating costs on a per mile basis uh, have been a little bit higher with those uh, first generation battery electric buses. And um, is there, uh, as, you, as you've taken a look, uh, projecting into the future with improved technology, is it a wash, continue to be more, might be less, do you have anything you uh, would anticipate? Sure, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would just say that right now uh, we're forecasting that uh, we know that the technology continues to improve. Uh, we know that, um, you know, the as I said, the diesel price is uh, not flat. It's not as easy to budget for. We're certainly optimistic that those prices are going to come a lot closer together, and we may see a, a tipping point where uh, operating these buses for the life cycle of the vehicle uh, could be comparable or, you know, perhaps ideally one day less. Uh, it's just a little bit early in the, our experience to be able to state that with a high degree of certainty. Thank you, that helps. I just, I, the, you know where the question come from, of course, be, comes from because uh, in the private vehicle sector, um, the upfront cost, of course, is a little bit more, not as much as it used to be. Not everyone needs to buy an $80,000 Tesla anymore, which is great, um, but you know, the savings in gas and the savings in repairs are substantial. Repairs are zero and gas is, you know, electricity versus gas is de minimis. Um, Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to clarify a couple things. Uh, I think we, we've had this discussion a couple times in the committee about the cost difference, but these are, those are pretty substantially larger numbers that we've been talking about that, that we talked about just a couple of years ago. Is that the Met Council's experience that those are actual purchase prices, that 1.2, 1.3? to just under $2 million for a single bus? Um, Mr. Funk. Yeah, Mr. Chair and uh, committee member, that, that is true. So uh, we are seeing a, a much higher uh, initial uh, investment price on a per unit basis. Uh, that has been accelerating. What I will say, though, is that uh, we're optimistic that we've gained some technology improvements along the way, additional battery storage that will allow us to operate those vehicles. And so uh, we're not buying uh, the same bus technology that we were uh, when we placed the order for uh, those initial buses back in the kind of 2017-2018 time frame. So uh, as we have made a, a higher investment, we're also uh, eager to gain some experience with what we hope is a better performance. Thank Certainly. you, Mr. Chair. In, uh, in a quick Google search, I'm looking online trying to compare some of these things because obviously it doesn't address them in the bill. We don't have a fiscal note attached. We don't have a dollar figure attached. Um, it, it's like 15 years for a service life expectancy on a, on a diesel bus. Is there electric vehicles? Are they looking at that same time frame or are we talking about significantly less? Because the talk about battery packs, we, we have that discussion here quite often. Um, what, what are we really looking at when you say the... When you, when you talked about the, the price of an electric vehicle as, as operating costs is more, do you include that battery pack in the life expectancy, or is that something just on a day-to-day -day basis? Mr. Funk. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, so um, we are, uh, again, we're in the early days of, of gaining this experience, and so what we're trying to do is trying to uh, each year gain our experience, what are the uh, operating costs that we're experiencing from both uh, charging the buses, maintaining the vehicles, uh, taking care of uh, whatever those repair needs are so that we can try to apply those over the life cycle of a bus. Uh, our industry is very familiar with the full life cycle of uh, diesel buses. We know what it takes to uh, take that bus from uh, when we receive it until when we retire uh, those vehicles. 
Uh, we don't yet have that experience with battery electric buses, and so uh, we're trying to be, you know, really diligent and smart about setting those milestones so that we can uh, have that uh, financial impact uh, inform our future plans and inform our decision. We know that uh, there are definitely some, you know, really good benefits to having this technology, um, you know, but again, we want to make sure that we're uh, sharing all the information we learn along the way uh, with uh, all of our stakeholders. So. Um, I guess all that to say, I don't have the exact number because we've not yet owned uh, our battery electric buses for long enough to be able to see a full life cycle cost. Mr. Chair, so I'll, I'll make it easier for you. <laughs> um, of the eight buses you have operating right now, have you replaced battery packs on them and how, how long have they been in operation? Mr. Funk. Mr. Chair and uh, committee members, so uh, on those eight buses, uh, we have not done wholesale uh, battery pack replacements. Uh, we've done uh, cell replacements, uh, and we've worked with the, the manufacturer on uh, addressing issues with you know battery strings, uh, you know things like that within the energy storage systems. Uh, we have not reached a point where we've had to uh, swap out uh, entire uh, ESS packs. And that and and I'm sorry, they've uh, been in operation since. June of 2019 in revenue service, so about five years. Okay. And, and Mr. Certainly. Chair, there's one more quick question here um, for, for the testifier. Um, there was a testifier that spoke before you that talked about the, the reliability rate. Are those numbers accurate when it comes to diesel versus electric versus, I'm assuming you have some natural gas buses as well? Mr. Funk. Or L uh, LP. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair and, uh, and committee member, uh, Metro Transit does not have any uh, liquefied natural gas buses. Uh, the uh, figures that were cited, um, they sounded very accurate compared to what we provided for our uh, council updates. And so they have not had the same uh, level of reliability uh, as the diesel buses that have been used as the uh, control group for that comparison. And so, um, you know, again, as we continue to gain experience, we're looking, we're uh, one of the larger transit agencies, you know, in the country, and we're pushing the manufacturers to uh, ensure that we're focused on that reliability, because I think one of the other things that I heard, you know, that resonates is, uh, you know, we need to be there when we say we're going to be there, and, and that's our commitment. And so as we continue to move forward, uh, the propulsion type is very important to us. Having a bus there uh, when we say it's going to be there is really important. And, and then just Certainly. maybe, this is maybe for the, the author more than the testifier. And when it comes to the six years implementation plan and, and subdivision nine, it says it must be a zero emission vehicle. So this isn't, you talked about off ramps, like for some of our local rural communities that, you know, we're having trouble keeping our buses that are not 20 years old, much less the new ones on the road. You know, there's, there's CCT buses out there in my district that are old vehicles. Um, if we're spending a million dollars on one transit bus when it's 15 passengers or more, we're going to have some issues. So, and then when it comes to the new Flyers of America, I think they're in St. Cloud, if I remember right. That group, do they have, uh, when, in this six-year time frame, do they have some technology advancements that are coming down the line that are going to make this feasible? Because if you look at the numbers so far, it doesn't look very feasible. Like, and we... And I, I did hear what you were saying about the advancements coming down the road, but I mean, there's some sort of guarantee here. There's no, there's no dollar figure attached to this bill. There's no fiscal note. There's, I'm a little confused, I guess, when it comes to how would we implement this and how would it look when it, when it comes to reality. I mean, the idea is one thing, but when it comes to reality and the six year time frame, what are we actually talking about here? Is there a plan in place? Does it exist? Does New Flyers of America say that in the next six years we're going to make it so efficient that it'll make diesel buses obsolete because I just don't see that in this bill. Senator McKeown. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to ask um, our expert here who's joined us to speak to your question, Senator. Thank you for the question. Um, I just would add that I, I do think it's very important to have goals that are not necessarily um, geared toward um, honoring skepticism about how about what we're going to be able to do in in a in a certain time frame, but about what we must do, and if with provided also that there be some flexibility, understanding that that 
it, it may be possible that we're not going to be there. But putting the date out after that, sort of preemptively saying we're not going to be able to do it, sets us up for a, a, an effort that is less than where we need to be in terms of the urgency with which we have to make our transition. So so I just, just to the to the topic of the date and, and what that should be based on, a sort of skepticism or a sort of hopeful, like, movement toward where we need to be is, I think, the better approach. But I'd like my expert to be able and, to And that. Mr. Chair, I think maybe I was just a little misunderstood. Certainly. I think if the fiscal and the reality combine, we come together and we say these electric buses can do this, and it's a must. We must do this, correct? If those technologies are out there and we're, and we're maybe blind to those technologies as a group, let's change this till next year. Let's do January 1st of 2025. Let's implement this now. Why wouldn't we? Right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. The, the question is, am I, are, are we looking at a hopeful bill here? Is this, is this something that we're planning on? Because if we're planning on it, it it's not here. Okay. That's, the, that, that's the challenge we're looking at. Ms. Baines. I mean, Thank you, Chair and committee member. Um, so as Senator McCune was saying, I think we support this because it gives some, some buffer to plan just for purchases, to be clear to be zero emissions starting 2030. Subdivision 7 on the sec, um, in two point, line 2.20 does lay out, the, of course, exemptions. So we are um, aware that there's challenges, as have been noted, in the market. But we think giving a clear policy signal is important. I will also note that New Flyer uh, provides buses to a number of transit agencies across the country who have taken much more ambitious goals than what we're doing in, in Minnesota. So near Fi New Flyer, you know, we're we've reached out. We're hoping to get more information from them. but. They are aware of the trends happening across the country, and they supply electric buses, um, for instance, to New York uh, MTA. And New York MTA has a, has adopted a very ambitious electrification goal. So, to to your kind of question, there is going to be movement to building more electric buses. I don't have the answer right now on sort of the the, the full cost of it, but I will note there's also a lot of funding from the federal government through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act to help build up the manufacturing capacity of electric vehicles, including electric bus manufacturers in the US. So I think there are resources resources out there to get us um, towards the goal in here, and then just more broadly towards more electric buses uh, across the US. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the answer, and I, I goals are great. I, I can't say that they're not great. Putting them in legislation. Uh, with musts. I mean, I have a goal that I should probably lose about 10 pounds in the next month. I really should. But without having a plan in place and saying, hey, I'm going to run this much every day, I'm not going to lose 10 pounds, right? I mean, that's, and I, I hate to simplify it that much, but that's what we're, you're asking us to, to, to make a law, right? There's to mandate plan. that by 2030 all electric vehicles are, or all buses are going to be electric. That's what it says in here. And I know there's some off ramps, I get it. But that's the decision we're making as a as a transportation committee in the Minnesota Senate today. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we're not going to actually make the decision today. So <laughs> yes. Um, so Mr. Keep, Chair. keep working on this. Senator McCune. Thank you. And, and I would also note that the bill does require that uh, plans be made. That's part of what the bill does. The bill sets out that we need to may be making these plans to accomplish these goals. So to the weight analogy, um, <laughs> you know, it, it would be more than just hopeful um, idea that we're going to lose 10 pounds in the next month, but it would be a, a real, I am going to make a plan today to set out how I am going to lose those 10 pounds this month so that I had the plan set and then I could actually execute it. So thanks. Thanks. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just kind of following up with the same thing as I, we have no fiscal notes. We have no idea what this is going to cost. And so one of my questions, uh, so, and maybe it's Mr. Funk, um, uh, so we, we're going to go to batteries now, and we haven't had a replacement on batteries yet in an existing, because we've only done that since 2019 or five years. Uh, so where do, where do these batteries come from? At the end of their life, where do they go? And I'll just tell you ahead of time, my thinking is, okay, if we're going to improve the air, uh, what other things could be offset by, by disposing of these batteries, things like that, the cost. And then I'll have another question as far as the cost of the infrastructure to upgrade for if we want to meet this goal. Uh, you know, if we need to, 
uh, fuel our buses with diesel, we don't have to upgrade any facilities. We just get the tanks refilled and we fill them up again. But uh, I just recently, uh, one of my buildings that I manage, I, we had to put in some chargers because my request. And it cost about $18,000 to upgrade the electrical for two residential car chargers. That's pretty significant. So when we're looking at that and we're talking, I don't know, hundreds of buses, the electrical charge that's going to take and the infrastructure to upgrade all that has got to be huge. And, and will that be included in the fiscal note when we get it? But uh, going back first question, where do the batteries come from? Where do they go when they're retired? And is that cost function or is that cost figured into the cost of the overall plan? Mr. Funk. Maybe yeah. that's like six questions. I'm sorry, but I'll keep, <laughs> I'll keep going for a while. So. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, so uh, the, the batteries that we uh, purchase, we have uh, our contract through New Flyer uh, for these buses. Uh, Gillig will be the one who we're seeking a contract for in the next one. Uh, that uh, OEM provides uh, all of that equipment to us, and so we're not actually you know, sourcing the batteries when it comes time for disposal. Uh, we have not done that yet, but uh, our plan would be that we would be seeking another party uh, to help with uh, either the recycling, repurposing of those. Uh, and, and what we are uh, expecting based on our you know, peer agency experience is that uh, there's still going to be a lot of very dense energy in those batteries. They just may not be suitable for the application of being used to propel an electric bus down the street. And so uh, you know, what they get uh, turned into, we don't yet know, but that uh, recycling and kind of a second, third, fourth life uh, for that energy is, is something that you know, we'll gain some more experience on. And then again, Mr. Senator Zinsky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so where are the batteries uh, manufactured? The, the ones that we're getting in the buses, where are those manufactured at? Mr. Funk. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, committee member, so the uh, batteries uh, that we are receiving are from a company uh, in Michigan. Uh, it's Exalt is the, uh, the battery manufacturer. At least that's on our, our current buses. Um, I'll have to uh, provide additional information on the, the source uh, for the buses that have yet to be built. And thank you, Mr. And then following up on the other question, as far as the the infrastructure to charge the buses, if we're going to replace them all, uh, what's that cost? Are we planning for that uh, again? Because I, I think it's going to be a large number. And again, we don't have a fiscal note on this uh, bill, which is frustrating that we don't have that. But we have an autonomous uh, mowing bill. We got a fiscal note on that already. But this bill came out earlier than that. We still have no fiscal note on this. So. Uh, what, what kind of costs are those going to be to upgrade that infrastructure to charge all those buses, I would assume, you know, during the day, uh, you know, if you're going from, you know, what do we say, we have 15 buses now, I think, and we're going to go to, I don't know how many we're going to go to, 50 or 100? I mean, what's the cost of that infrastructure to upgrade all, all that? Uh, Mr. Chair and committee member, I think that it would probably be best for uh, us to get back to you on what those specific costs are. Right now, our experience has been based on that pilot program, which is one, one charger for each bus. Uh, we know at scale that's not required, just like we don't need one gas pump for each vehicle. And so uh, we have been working on some of those projections to do this uh, at a large scale, and you know, I think we'd be happy to be able to provide a more detailed uh, figures to the committee. And the fiscal note is in process. I assume you are involved in <laughs> yeah, yeah. developing that. Yes, so yes, sir. We'll see that uh, before too long, and you know, before, of course, we take the bill back up. If in fact we do for yeah. omnibus, so Senator just and I just want to make sure those costs are figured into that as well, because again, right now for replacing buses that operate on diesel, there's no cost in there. We basically fill our tanks up. They're there, obviously. I think I would assume you guys have your own tank, so you know, in a 20 or 30 year cycle, you might replace those tanks. But in this instance. Uh, it's going to be a much higher cost to upgrade that uh, co uh, upgrade that infrastructure. So, uh, anxious to see the fiscal note on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm, I'm wondering when you, you speak about um, operating expenses and the uh, you said you replace some cells and some of the the batteries. Uh, what is the the warranty on? These products, you know, on for instance, on the drivetrain, on the batteries, you know, I bought an electric car and I have a 120,000 miles or 12 years on my battery, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't cost me anything for 12 years. And I'm wondering what your uh, what the experience is with these commercial uses. Mr. Funk, uh, Mr. Chair, and committee members. So uh, the way that uh, that we have uh, bus warranties, uh, it comes down to a component level. And so 
Uh, we have warranties that can be spec'd um, for you know, some of the, the propulsion system, the battery system. Um, and so uh, what we've done uh, with these, the, the pilot buses and what we'll be doing moving forward is looking at you know, somewhere between two, five, seven year warranties based on our experience and the systems that we're trying to cover. Ultimately, uh, we believe that you know, to a large degree it's in our best interest to be able to uh, have technicians who are capable of making repairs themselves uh, and uh, you know, being able to do that work. But as we gain experience, that warranty can provide a, a good backup to be able to do things like swapping out parts and uh, taking care so we can provide reliable service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Anything further, members? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I see MnDOT in the, in the audience, uh, and I see that the bill requires MnDOT to make the plan. I was just wondering if they've got staff working on this already or if they if this is going to take additional staff or Mr. Rudine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs and Senator Howe to your question. Um, I think we're still working on the fiscal note as well. Uh, so we will try to quantify that for you. I mean, we do have staff in our Office of Transit and Active Transportation. We also have staff um, in the Office of Sustainability and Public Health, and I think, you know, they could kind of coordinate on this. So I don't, um, I don't anticipate there would be a, a significant amount of staff costs uh, to MnDOT, but um, again, pending finalization of the fiscal note, I can't guarantee that. All right, Senator Howe. All right. All right, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just while I think I, I read through a question. So this is for uh, buses larger than 15. So does this affect metro mobility as well? I, maybe that 15 number is there for a reason. But is that uh, making a metro mobility van uh, or a, a smaller bus uh, go to the same reason? So what's the cost difference between an electric metro mobility vehicle versus a metro bus? So if you could address that issue as well. Senator McEwen, or Ms. Baines. Thank you, Chair and committee members. So, um, so Metro Mobility, I believe, is less than 15 um, spaces generally. I have to double check that, but it is meant for larger electric buses. Um, and on the Metro Mobility side, I know there is uh, discussion on how to electrify those, but those are even more nascent than the bigger electric bus manufacturing. And again, while we would we are looking forward for this bill, providing some planning on how to reach those goals. We, we recognize that as a separate area and we'll have kind of separate challenges from the, from the larger buses that we're mostly talking about here. And Mr. Chair, just to follow up, so again, why are, I don't say targeting, why are we going one and not the other? So if you, if you want this new electrification, why are we choosing one bus versus a different bus? Because they're both contributing. And so. My guess, my question is, if you're going to do this, why doesn't the bill just have everything? All buses uh, purchased by Metro or by uh, Met Council or uh, MnDOT or whatever, why, why, why are we singling out not doing Metro Mobility at this time? Ms. Yeah. Baines. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Well, we, <laughs> we would love that from you know, a policy perspective and an advocacy perspective. I think we'd want to just talk to some of those folks now to understand that space better. We have better knowledge of the electric transit bus spaces are larger, hence the um, support for this bill. But we, of course, are thinking about metro mobility and those size vehicles. It's just um, we thought it would be better to start with the larger transit buses since we're more familiar and with them and the market for those buses are more developed as we understand it than the smaller metro mobility. But it, it is something generally we are considering kind of down the line. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, uh, just, last, just a last comment is this all sounds great, but we, we do have to know the fiscal uh, note on this. I mean, this sounds like a huge number. I assume Med Council and MnDOT are all concerned about what this is going to cost because we're going to basically putting uh, one less bus for every bus we're buying out there because it sounds like it's two to one, and, and that doesn't even include the infrastructure uh, to, to upgrade the you know, fueling of them. So I just hope we uh, understand that because it's, it's, it's going to be a huge dollar amount. So thank you. Anything further, members? All right. Um, so with that, we will lay Senate File 4938 on the table, as amended, for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill.
fiscal supplemental fiscal bill. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Members, we're going to um, switch it up just a little bit here. I'm going to jump to the testifying table to present Senate File 4719 um, because uh, the mayor of Minneapolis is here, would like to um, share some thoughts about that proposal and then he needs to get on his way. So. Welcome to the testifier's table, Mr. Chair. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to start by offering the A1 amendments. And Senator Dibble offers the A1 amendment. Uh, and uh, just by way of quick description, that's, this is a delete everything amendment. Uh, council was uh, helpful in uh, creating this amendment. Um, it's, it's mostly just reorganizing uh, the, <clears throat> the bill uh, to conform to the conventions. Um, that we have in, in how we construct these particular policy proposals and also buttons up some elements around making appointments, first meetings of the governing entity, um, et cetera. So, uh, Mr. Greenfield, did I miss anything? So, Chair Dibble, would you like to adopt the, the A1? Yes. Okay. Members, all in favor of the A1, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The A1 is adopted, and Mr. Greenfield will walk us through it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, the as introduced version of Senate File 4719 uh, on page two creates a board that was is responsible for the distribution of program expenditures. So this delete everything amendment um, reorganizes this uh, board as a separate entity, uh, kind of following the drafting guidelines for entities that are created to uh, you know by the legislature to administer a certain program. Um, and so certain requirements for the board are set forth in, in the new section two. Um, and there, so there isn't a ton of substantive difference between the as introduced bill that contains, you know, the source of the money, the where the money is supposed to be directed as a part of the anti-displacement programming. Uh, and the, the membership is still the same for the entity, but now the entity is a little bit more uh, the detail on the entity is a little bit more granular and, and, and in line with other state um, entities that the legislature has created in the past. So uh, I also believe that this bill will be sent to state and local government. So they will also have a, a fresh set, a chance, opportunity to explore how this program may be administered and, and operationalized. Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. Senator Dibble. <clears throat> Thank you. And just uh, so the committee is clear, um, the state and local Dean Danes to hear this and and um, and approve it. Ultimately, this bill would come back for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So we're not relinquishing it uh, just because we're sending it on to state and local. So um, if we need to do more work on it, there will be that opportunity. So very very quickly, I'll just provide a very very quick high level overview. There's a lot of people here who can speak more eloquently to um, this initiative and why it's important. Um, but by way of, of quick summary and overview. Uh, of course, uh, we're aware that the Blue Line extension um, is, is more likely than not uh, to be uh, light rail transit. I think that's the uh, mode uh, and the alignment is shaping up uh, and it, it has, it's going to go from, of course, downtown Minneapolis up through north Minneapolis and, and on to the northwestern suburbs. It has the potential, of course, to be very transformative in a very positive way for those communities along that corridor uh, in many ways. Uh, both. Uh, giving folks access uh, to jobs, education, and other opportunities, uh, and representing fixed investment um, that then, of course, spurs uh, private site investment, much like we've seen along the Central Corridor and, and Hiawatha and the like. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, very positive, usually, in, in most respects. Um, but if we don't do these things well in a, in a way that's intelligent and intentional, um, it can, all of that, what we would view from a distance to be very positive activity can be very disruptive and cause uh, uh, unintended consequences such as displacing people from their ability to even afford the community where they've lived some, some for generations, where they have um, their social connections, their institutions, uh, and, and so many other things. And so this is a recognition that uh, transit investments, while positive, um, those positive attributes and benefits 
um, that are associated uh, need to be intentional and strategic, uh, and that takes uh, a, a gathering of community and a sharing of values and a prioritization, prioritization of resources. So, um, so some resources are uh, identified, and the purposes of them would be to provide uh, opportunities for residents to stay in place, feel supported, uh, preserve access to safe and affordable housing, to incentivize community institutions, business organizations, and community members, uh, to own property along the corridor, to incentivize um, uh, uh, other uh, uh, cultural attributes, uh, keep the rich culture of the corridor in place and thriving, to improve infrastructure around the project, or allow opportunities for the community to connect, uh, and to increase participation of corridor residents uh, in the light rail transit extension project and program initiatives. It contemplates a 15-member governing board, which would be comprised of community members and local officials, uh, and of course provides for reporting back to the legislature so that we can keep track of these kinds of investments. So I'll, sus I'll suspend there and uh, welcome the mayor of Minneapolis to share his thoughts. Yeah. Welcome to the Transportation Committee, Mr. Mayor. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for having me. Senators, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Senator Scott Dibble, for your authorship of this very critical uh, piece of legislation. Uh, for the record, my name is Jacob Fry, and I'm the mayor of Minneapolis, and I'm here to speak in favor of Senate File 4719, which will provide $10 million in 2024 and then $10 million in 2025 for this critical anti-displacement work that Senator Dibble just mentioned. Uh, we all know that the Blue Line extension uh, this Blue Line uh, project can be transformative, has the potential to be transformative in nature. Uh, we also know that the promise generally given when you do these large-scale economic development and transportation initiatives is that the surrounding area will benefit economically. Oftentimes, the values go up, uh, the rents then rise along with them, and the people that made these neighborhoods wonderful to begin with get displaced from those same neighborhoods that they made wonderful. Uh, the whole concept here is that we can provide a, an important benefit, a boost. We can give them the ability to stay in these neighborhoods that they've participated so greatly in. And importantly, the north side is seeing quite a bit of momentum as we speak. Businesses are opening up. Entrepreneurs are running with great ideas, and we want to make sure that, again, they are able to reap the benefit of all the work that they've done. The city has an ownership and opportunity fund, which helps these same individuals, these business owners, uh, not just own the underlying business, but own the underlying real estate, so that when that value goes up, when that equi equity is gained, uh, they can, again, reap the benefit of it. Uh, and, and of course, there's the, there's the work of making sure that tenants, that renters, uh, that could potentially get uh, displaced uh, when those values rise are, are able to stay. Uh, it's not just the values that are rising, it's also the, the, the real physical displacement that could potentially occur when a, a light rail extension takes place. Uh, this is development and preservation of affordable housing. This is supporting business, gr business growth and creation of jobs. This is investments in community and commercial development. Uh, and the city certainly will continue to be a project partner as part of this Metro Blue Line and support growth across the entire corridor, uh, as well as the anti-displacement work group design and the engineering that goes well beyond some of the project benefits that are immediately apparent. Um, and I just appreciate the committee's time on this one. This bill is of critical importance to this city of Minneapolis, and I know so many of the other cities that are also along this very same uh, Blue Line corridor. Again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for your leadership here, uh, and uh, I'm obviously happy to answer any questions if you have them down the line. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Chair Dibble, I have a list of testifiers that I'm going to begin to call up to the table, if that's okay. Oh, Madam Chair. Mr. Uh, Chair Dibble. So uh, if, if we could ask maybe Ms. Boyd to just give us a quick rundown of the fiscal note that I had a question for Mr. Greenfield about just one word in the amendment. Ms. Boyd. Um, Ms. Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, I believe you asked me to just comment on the fiscal note? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, 
Uh, so the fiscal note is written to the introduced version of the bill. Um, if you know if the amended language moves forward, we'll be relooking at that and getting a new uh, fiscal estimate for that. Um, but if you look at the fiscal note, um, it, it starts in fiscal year 2024, identified as general fund expenditures um, under MnDOT of approximately 10 million a year. That is the appropriation that's in the bill currently, 10 million per year. And then uh, there are additional costs identified, starting on page seven <clears throat> from MnDOT as part of uh, the grant administration that would be MnDOT's responsibility under this language. Um, that would be staff time for grant administration support meetings, meetings with locals, administrative tasks, et cetera. And that is estimated to um, run in expenditures of, I'm sorry, if you look at page eight of the fiscal note, uh, roughly 16,000 in the first year and 11,000 a year thereafter from Minda. So that would be added to the $10 million. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. And Madam Chair, we have a $2 million one-time target, so I have to get really creative. <laughs> uh, and then um, uh, the question I have for Mr. Greenfield um, is on line 2.2, the last word. I'm wondering if, if observing is the word we want or preserving is the word we want. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Uh, Madam Chair and Chair Dibble, that is correct. It should be preserving existing uh, levels of ownership. So we can make that as an oral amendment. All right, I'll move that oral amendment, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, good catch. So just to re reiterate for the committee, that would be on page two, line, uh, line two, delete observing and insert preserving. Members discussion. <laughs> All in favor of the oral amendment, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, nay. The oral amendment is adopted. Senator Dibble. Thanks. Um, so we could go to... Now on to testifiers. Testifiers. Very good. <laughs> so if uh, I have C. Terrence Anderson from the University of Minnesota Center for Urban and Regional Affairs and Finn McGarity from the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability, if you would both come forward, please. Welcome to the testifiers table. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Yes. Uh, I'm C. Terrence Anderson, Director of Community-Based Research at the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs, or CURA, at the University of Minnesota, uh, a public policy research center that focuses on connecting with government and community to lead to more just, more equitable policies and outcomes for all Minnesotans. Uh, as members might be aware, Chair, members, as you might be aware, the Blue Line Project um, has been a project for well over a decade. Throughout that time, residents of North Minneapolis in Robbinsdale, Crystal, and Brooklyn Park have been asking that anti-displacement be considered as part of the project to look at the different impacts that the project might have beyond uh, simply uh, rails in the ground. Uh, in February of 2022, um, after being contracted by Hennepin County and the Metropolitan Council, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs convened the Anti-Displacement Working Group which was a member, which comprised of 26 members um, from community, government, and philanthropy that asked the question, what might anti-displacement look like? Um, if that is a real issue um, as a result of the Blue Line uh, planning uh, implementation and operation, and to consider what policies and recommendations and strategies might be implemented in order to prevent displacement um, and gentrification along the Blue Line Extension Corridor. Uh, this group met for about 18 months uh, in which we considered uh, lots of different information. We conducted uh, a significant body of research that looked at uh, not only the Blue Line Extension Corridor, but as well as other uh, light rail corridors throughout the Twin Cities, including the Green Line, existing Green Line, and existing Blue Line, to see the impact that uh, light rail had on existing residents and businesses and culture um, along each of those lines. Uh, throughout those 18 months, uh, Kira conducted research on this corridor, as well as what happened in other corridors around the country. We looked at different anti-displacement policies that have been impact or have, have been implemented, uh, not only in uh, the Twin Cities, but as well as around the country as well too. Uh, we considered what governments are already currently working on, the things that they're already implementing that might have an effect on anti-displacement, um, as well as different things that they might do that might have more of an impact towards community-centered goals. Uh, we wanted to contextualize the development in the Twin Cities through our research. We wanted to center this work group as, as an embodiment of the voice of community and their needs throughout this process. And ultimately, we wanted to lead to anti-displacement anti recommendations that we believe 
and our research supported to be affected to prevent or to ensure that the Blue Line extension has the maximal benefits for the existing residents um, along the Blue Line um, corridor. At the end of that, we published a report in May of 2023 that has an extensive body of research that, in, in, that is included in it, as well as a number of different recommendations on different policies, um, strategies, and frameworks that might be implemented uh, to prevent displacement as a result of the Blue Line extension. Uh, today, uh, we continue that work in the context of this bill, and thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Noelle Sirisan from MN350, please come forward, and then please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Chair Dibble, um, and members of the committee. My name is Finn McGarity, and I'm a coalition organizer for the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. I've worked in transit advocacy and as an advocate for transportation equity issues for over six years now, um, and I'm so excited to lend my support for this bill. As my colleague Ricardo Perez says about the anti-displacement work he leads in the Blue Line Coalition, it's not about the train, it's about the people. And I think that captures a lot of what goes unseen for those of us who are passionate about transit. We don't care about transit because of how fast it can go or the bells and whistles about a particular mode. We care about transit, I care about transit, because of the difference good transit that is designed in partnership with community can make in people's lives. Access to quality transit has the potential to close achievement gaps for community college students and improve health equity. And access to reliable transportation is routinely cited as one of the most salient social determinants of upward social mobility. Put plainly, good transit has the ability not only to move us through our communities, but to also propel our lives forward. Therefore, it is imperative that transit development be planned intersectionally with housing and racial justice in mind. Light rail, in particular, has been well documented for the role it can play in displacing community members and spurring rapid gentrification. If the community members along the Blue Line corridor are pushed out of their homes and businesses as a result of this project going through unmitigated, then what is the point of the train? If anti-displacement funding is not secured for the community before, during, and after construction, then all of those benefits and opportunities that come along with transit will be missed for the people who need transit the most. Thankfully, this body is stepping up to help mitigate these risks proactively with Senate File 4719. I want to thank Senator Dibble and the other co-authors of this bill, which I believe is a critical step to actualizing transit equity and advancing community prosperity. I hope to see Senate File 4719 passed into law so the communities along the Blue Line Corridor have the resources needed to build an abundant future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And would uh, Carla Arredondo from Pueblos de Lucha y Esperanza come forward, please? And then please proceed. State your name for the record and please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Hello, my name is Noelle Saracen, and I'm the political manager at Minnesota 350 Action. MN 350 Action is a nonprofit organization focusing on climate justice. I'd like to thank the chair and members of this committee um, for allowing me to speak today in support of Senate File 4719. Um, there is no doubt that we at MN350 love public transit when it is done well. Um, expanding this blue line, which is already going to be happening, into areas where people are less likely, likely to own a car and need to utilize public transit as a means of ensuring that they can access work and commerce will offer easier commutes and help allow Minnesotans to connect to the metro in a way that will help reduce climate disruption. And that is one of the main goals that we at MN350 have, but we also greatly encourage climate justice in a way that will mean that the solutions and the outcome of some of the issues that climate is, that is occurring in climate that we cannot escape do not affect black and brown folks and frontline communities more than it would, say, my community um, living in the southwest suburbs. However, if we are going to make sure that the people in the Blue Line Corridor reap the benefits of public transit in their area, it often comes, I mean, we have to protect it because that often comes at risk of them losing their homes. And one way that we have seen this here in the Metro is um, I-94, that corridor has separated black and brown communities in the past. Other highway and transit programs have um, caused that same issue before. It is also most common for individuals to bear the greatest burden of climate um, are some of the communities that we see along this corridor. In fact, black Americans are 40% more likely to live in areas directly impacted by climate disruption. 
but we cannot keep asking the communities to bear the burden of climate mitigation and impacts alone, and we cannot make it harder for longtime residents to stay in their homes and divide their communities. If individuals that may benefit most from the blue line are going to see that benefit, we need to make sure that they have the opportunity to stay in the communities that they have helped build, in the businesses that they have helped to make thrive, and to maintain the relationships that they have just by being good neighbors. Um, we must keep frontline communities in place so that we can reap the benefits of public transportation alongside them. Um, and I really encourage you all to vote in favor of Senate File 4719 because that will help us to reach that end goal. MN 350 Action asks that you support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, could Brandon um, Divasanga from the Laos Center of Minnesota please come to the testifier's table? And please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, and thank you, Chair Dibble, Vice Chair Morrison, and members of the committee. My name is Carla Redondo. I'm the Executive Director of Pueblos de Lucha y Esperanza and a member of the Blue Line Coalition. I am also a Northsider with roots which take me back to elementary school with relationships in these neighborhoods with the community who lives and goes to church in North Minneapolis. I am here to testify in support of Senate File 4719 uh, because at Pueblos we believe in a world where all, in a world where all people are free to move, to stay, and to live without fear. We believe that this bill can help people to benefit from the proposed transit line. When I first started working with the Blue Line Coalition, I knew very little about the Blue Line Extension Project, but I was an expert in my community and about my neighborhood and its assets. To see the work of anti-displacement moving forward is an honor and a call for action. It's a reflection of the work we have all invested in making sure that this project does not happen to us, but rather we become co-creators. At the point in time when the alignment change from Highway 55 was being proposed, I found information which pointed at the fact that only 65 Spanish-speaking community members had been engaged. <clears throat> this for us was unacceptable. Nowadays, the Spanish-speaking community at Ascension Church at 18th and DuPont and St. Alphonsus Church in Brooklyn Park are included in our efforts of not only sharing the work we are doing, but invite them to co-create the solutions we are pushing forward. We are well aware that displacement has occurred along the previously planned route along Highway 55 and that we need to get ahead of planning processes in order to protect the community and allow us to participate in determining the future of the line in our communities. For us to consult community members who usually and historically have gone underrepresented is anti-displacement work, and our vision of abundance is shaped by those voices, the voices of mom who work multiple jobs to feed their families, to the people who are interested and hungry in growing their small businesses and expanding them. The resources that the bill would help allocate towards anti-displacement efforts would be important to us, better including our communities in creating the vision for in ultimately benefiting from the proposed Blue Line Extension. This is why I urge you to adopt and move forward Senate File 4719 to help us materialize our vision of abundance and help catalyze the political and economic power of our Spanish-speaking communities across the corridor of Blue Line Extension. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Board Chair and Hennepin County Commissioner Irene Fernando, please come to the testifier's table and please state your name for the record. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name um, and proceed with your testimony. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon, um, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brandon Debungsa and I represent the Lao Assistance Center of Minnesota and the Lao community in support of Senate File 4719. We have been a founding member of the Blue Line Coalition since the early beginnings of the Blue Line Extension Project, advocating for community voice and inclusion in public decisions that affect the future of our com communities. The Lao community and many other Southeast Asian communities have experienced a long history of displacement from, from their homes dating back to the Vietnam War and the secret, secret war in Laos and Cambodia, a trauma that has lingered in the hearts of our communities and one that will continue to this day with this project if we do not address the problem properly. We ask the committee to be mindful of what our communities have faced due to past harms and how we can take steps to rectify the decades of inequalities and pain. 
for the Lao community, and I believe the, uh, for other Southeast Asian communities, we envision a, a future of abundance where our future generations can be proud of their community and be allowed new opportunities to shape their futures in Minnesota and across the country. With this new alignment paired together with meaningful support of anti-displacement, we as leaders can take steps to challenge past norms and rebuild the trust and collaboration we have with our communities. With this project, we look forward to the potential redevelopment of our local communities to diversify and build a strong cultural, cultural and safe corridor that celebrates our past and links us to the present as Asian Americans. However, we cannot celebrate such a future without first ensuring our communities can stay in their homes and continue to be part of it and its future. These investments into anti-displacement policies will benefit and protect our communities and set a precedent for fair and just strategies that work to support communities in future decision making and build mutual and collaborative trust. In conclusion, I ask that the communities support Senate File 4719 to help start funding anti-displacement and let us begin materializing a vision of abundance and prosperity for all of our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Hollis Winston, Brooklyn Park Mayor, please come to the testifier's table. And please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair and Senators, I'm Hennepin County Board Chair Irene Fernando and use she, her pronouns. I'm the youngest woman to ever serve on the Hennepin County Board. I'm the first Filipino American elected in the state of Minnesota. And I'm the first board chair of color in Hennepin's history 172 years ago. Um, I'm very eager to speak about this bill because I'm a regular transit user. I'm a North <coughs> Minneapolis resident. And we are bringing forward the vision that communities have created for themselves in partnership with the governments along the corridor. Hennepin County serves residents by investing in comprehensive transit network with high frequency transit lines like light rail and bus rapid transit that meets the growing needs of our diverse communities. The Blue Line Extension Light Rail Transit Project will connect Brooklyn Park through Crystal, Robbinsdale, and North Minneapolis to downtown Minneapolis and the broader transit network. It will bring transformational benefits to our communities. These communities are transit reliant, racially diverse, and have felt the lasting impacts of historic redlining and disinvestment. Since this project was first introduced, community has voiced concerns about the risks for residential, economic, and cultural displacement impacts. To respond to this feedback, and to ensure current residents and businesses share in the project benefits, Hennepin County and the Metropolitan Council started a first-of-its-kind, community-oriented, anti-displacement initiative, contracting with Cura to study and recommend anti-displacement strategies. Corridor communities and residents spent 18 months together to develop anti-displacement recommendations contained in a report to ensure community prosperity. And then the governments worked for six months to develop a joint legislative platform. In my time in office, I have not seen a legislative platform among this many corridor communities so focused on the same end outcome. It's because Hennepin County, alongside our partners, recognize the urgency Blue Line Extension neighbors feel to implement strong anti-displacement measures. We've intentionally aligned our work on this project within Hennepin County's Disparity Reduction Department to better coordinate action across our jurisdiction with the goal to meaningfully reduce pre-existing disparities and to strengthen existing neighborhoods. This bill will, will significantly boost our work by establishing and funding a corridor anti-displacement community prosperity program while leveraging additional local, philanthropic, and hopefully federal dollars. It will bring our diverse communities and governments to the table in a meaningful way to implement the strategies identified by the anti-displacement work group. We must listen to community. When it comes to large-scale infrastructure projects, we cannot repeat the mistakes of the past, and we must invest in a climate future, climate action future. Uh, we have an opportunity today uh, and responsibility to ensure this project benefits the residents and businesses currently in these communities so they can experience the transformative benefits the rail project and the subsequent development and amenities uh, can bring now and for generations to come. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. And will Mia Parisian of Robbinsdale City Council please come to the testifier's table? And in the meantime, welcome Mr. Mayor. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, so thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Senators. My name is Hollis Winston, the Mayor of the City of Brooklyn Park. 
Uh, I'm here, I was actually here earlier, not, not at the Senate, but at the House. I was at the Capitol earlier talking about another bill, uh, and it's a biotech bill. And if we look at our city of Brooklyn Park and many Northwest suburbs, uh, there's a huge economic gap and a, just a, a chronic lack of investment. So when we even look at our how much money our taxpayers can pay per capita versus uh, the LGA received. Uh, Brooklyn Park is on the low end of both spectrums, so we don't receive the investment, and that has kind of its inevitable outcomes. But when we look at our city of Brooklyn Park, I like to say we're the fifth, other people say the sixth. We're not gonna quibble about details today. Uh, but we're 60% people of color, that is not in doubt. And within that 60% people of color, there are that reflects many of the disparities that we see at the state level. We're bringing the biotech bill forward, and, and this does apply here, because we're, we have 700 acres of land that's undeveloped. Well, a part of that, along that corridor, the light rail would run there. And we believe if we are creating a biotech uh, district, we're working with Greater MSP and some other folks, we can create eight to 10,000 jobs along that. Much of that depends on uh, the light rail coming or a hub being created there. We think the light rail makes the most sense. But this also, from a more personal perspective, when we talk about the anti-displacement dollars with this, as we create those opportunities, eight to 10,000 jobs, I have a personal story. Didn't necessarily impact me uh, uh, right away, but my father grew up on one side of the Eisenhower in Chicago, Illinois, and the Eisenhower went right through his neighborhood. Those families that were displaced, some of them have not recovered to this day. He, however, because he was not displaced, was able to integrate his uh, school, was able to integrate, uh, help integrate Northern Illinois, got his law degree, and was able to provide a certain lifestyle along with my mother who did many of the same things uh, growing up. For me, as we create these opportunities, this anti these anti-displacement dollars are incredibly important, not only because we don't want to displace people, we also want to look forward on this thing. We want to say, how can we use these dollars to offer those along that line opportunities to partake in the economic opportunities that are going to be uh, unleashed, especially in an area like Brooklyn Park where we're very much focusing on economic development. So anti-displacement is very important to my city. We know it's important to people from a, um, from a very personal level, but also when we talk about that Northwest Quarter, which has been underinvested in, uh, this is important to make sure everybody is able to share in those economic benefits. Thank you very much for your testimony. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair and members. My name is Mia Parisian, Robbinsdale Council Member. The City of Robbinsdale has participated in the anti-displacement work group since meetings began in the spring of 2022. Over that time, the group ultimately made recommendations on programs and policies for considerations. While a regional project of this magnitude will provoke ben promote benefits to many along the corridor and adjoining communities, the City of Robbinsdale recognizes that many, including residents and the business community, will face adverse effects of displacement. Again, recognizing a major investment in infrastructure like the Blue Line Extension is a regional project. The City of Robbinsdale will continue to advocate for the entire corridor and the city itself simultaneously. Some key takeaways of the full anti-displacement recommendations report are as follows. So firstly, the anti-displacement project report supports the development, preservation, and access of safe and affordable housing and housing choice. Robbinsdale has naturally occurring affordable housing that is at risk of disappearing, and smaller jurisdictions like Robbinsdale lack financial resources to prop up our own preservation programs. Increased funding and technical assistance from the county would support these efforts, as well as the young families who choose Robbinsdale for affordable housing and stay for the thriving community. The recommendations in this report advocate for small businesses by improving the climate for businesses po post-construction and prioritizing the development of spaces for small businesses. This matters to Robbinsdale especially because we have an authentic human scale downtown district that is adjacent to the corridor and consists of thriving small businesses that are the commercial pulse of Robbinsdale. Finally, the project report considers public realm enhancement by improving infrastructure around the project. One of the most common statements that Robbinsdale residents make about the existing County Road 81 corridor is that it splits Robbinsdale in half. There is a unique opportunity for the light rail extension to improve safety and connectivity, making this corridor feel like more of a connector of people and businesses rather than a divider. This matters deeply to Robbinsdale residents and businesses who strive to keep the rich culture of the corridor in place 
and enhance it so that it thrives. We need to ensure that youth and families feel safe on and around the light rail and therefore feel excited and proud to remain in their communities. Each of these considerations and recommendations put, put forth in the anti-displacement project report align with the values that I hold when advocating for the residents of Robbinsdale as we prepare for the Blue Line extension. Ultimately, we are working to ensure that the Robbinsdale community is better connected, better supported, and a better place to live, work, and visit as a result of the anti-displacement efforts this program aims to achieve. And I am very happy to testify in support of establishing and funding the Blue Line Extension Anti-Displacement Community Prosperity Program. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify in Senate File 4719 as amended? Welcome. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, members, the committee, Senator. Um, I think I gave one up there. I'm Jean Lee. I head uh, Children's Hope International, which is a legal advocacy and public policy group. Uh, our, our family centers are our shelters, transitional, and permanent housing. We do housing services, health care services, and human services. And APEC is a, a loose a, uh, housing consortium. Um, I have myself have a history of real estate development, property management, contracting, and small business. So I know the house and various other positions in the housing industry. So I'm familiar with some of the construction that they're talking about here. Um, I'm also a former uh, Fortune 500 corporate auditor, and I switched to uh, fixing government systems to better serve. Uh, Minnesotans. I think this is an outstanding bill, and um, it's comprehensive, well thought out, involved the communities in its decision making, and I was really impressed with everything I saw. Um, I like the idea as far as them preserving and enhancing affordable housing to allow for aging in place, safety, small business, and economic development, community ownership, culture, job trainings, and placements of the residents including having residents work within their communities with this, the funding that's going to be provided. Um, I, but being an auditor, I also uh, thought that I should uh, ask that you folks consider, whether it be in this bill or for those who are implementing it, that they consider expediting and prioritizing the needs of the seniors and persons with disabilities so they can age in place and not become homeless because when they become homeless, that's an early death for them. Also, um, to the extent that this bill can overcome the negative impact that the green uh, line light rail transit, I was part of the um, uh, initial studies, of, I mean, organizing on that. So I saw, you know, some of the problems that they had. Um, and then there were problems, you know, history-wise as far as uh, Highway 94. Um, I think the bill offers, is broad enough, it offers uh, possibilities for solutions as far as uh, the maintenance and repairs of homes by enhancement. But the solutions are also included in the Home Heroes Act legacy, which is House File 4620 and 4642. One point I wanted to make is that the... Uh, Board reports back to the legislature. I've seen board reports of different agencies, and I think that to the extent that they can include the community and uh, everybody comes in consensus, I think that's the best ideal. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Welcome back to the test fires table. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Marino. Um, I used to live over North Minneapolis, and so this project is something that I've followed for a, a long time. And I've spoken to many of my friends, many who still live along this corridor. And the number one thing I always hear for them is like, I mean, it sounds good, but if, it's not, if I'm not gonna be able to still live here when it's built, what good is it for me? What good is it for the community that I've grown to love? I've gone to probably about five or six meetings um, for the Blue Line, and at times I've seen people brought to tears over their fears with this line. 
Um, they, there's been mentioned many times that there is, you know, the anti-displacement plan and is a really good plan. I would highly recommend anyone reading it, but people don't have trust in words on a paper. They need to know that there's funding there, that this is actually going to be implemented instead of saying, Hey, we have all these great ideas, but when it comes down to it, when the rubber meets the road, none of that happens. And so I think this is a really great opportunity to show the rest of the nation what it means when you integrate community in the beginning of this project, when you center anti-displacement over, the, over these type of investments. Another thing too is that over this summer, most likely there's gonna be municipal consent happening with many of these cities along the line. And how can a city like for example, Minneapolis really say that we give our consent to this if we don't know that there's gonna be funding for anti-displacement? And so I really urge people to make sure that this happens this session, that it does not get pushed off into the future. We need this help now before speculation comes. We want development on that line. There needs to be more jobs, more housing around that line, but if it comes at the expense of people living there, that's not gonna be good for the area. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Dibble, any comments before we turn to member discussion? No, I'm uh, available for questions, comments, ideas, amendments. <laughs> Members, discussion. Uh, Senator Herr. Senator, Senator Dipple, um, and, and folks who testify, I just want to say I will voice my, I will put my voice in support of this bill, this is good legislation, because, uh, you know, I've seen the development mm -hmm. of, you know, the, uh, the light rail here and, you know, the the discussion approval of uh, our rapid transit, the gold line and then purple line will be coming through my district very, very soon. Um, and 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 they're they're doing their due diligence, but not good enough because when you leave it to some agency, sometimes they overlook uh, people that matter. And as I see the testifier here today, you have a full house uh, representative, all demographic, and they, they re it's it's really meaningful for them. They really care. Uh, and I just want to voice like when that we should get funding for this and so that um, so that there's resource to include community as we progress forward. So I just want to voice my support for this legislation. Thank you, Senator Herr. Senator Dibble, a comment? Or? Thank you, Senator Herr. Let the words stand. <laughs> Members, further discussion? Well. Senator Dibble, concluding remarks. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate the, the time and attention. Like I said, uh, there's, there's more work to be done. I've had some sidebar conversations with a few members of our committee and probably share um, some of the perspective uh, as well. So we'll continue to work on, on this proposal. Um, but uh, I am, I'm greatly honored uh, to carry this, this legislation. And of course, it comes from community, as, as Chair uh, Fernando said. Um, and it's kind of the, the best way that uh, ideas for solutions come forward is uh, through the lived experience that people are willing to share and, and then become active on. Um, so with that, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to uh, move that Senate File 4, 4719 as amended be recommended to pass referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Very good, Senator Dibble. Members, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Senate file 4719 as amended is passed and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. And I think that we're going to move to Senator Jasinski, 5142. All right, welcome to the testifiers table, Senator Jasinski. Um, we're gonna start with your Senate file 5142, is that true? That Great. is correct. Senate file sure. 4152, please proceed. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 5142 is basically just uh, myself uh, driving back and forth on uh, Interstate 35 over the years watching uh, some of the traffic issues that are created uh, when the mowing is taking place uh, down the interstate. Uh, I refer them to as shredder strips, uh, but they're the, the uh, safety rail that uh, divide the highway. And a lot of times uh, going along those areas, they're mowing or even just the ditches. And uh, at one point I decided I would, I would see how long traffic was backed up. So uh, when I got to the, where the mower was, I looked back and I kept uh, track of my odometer and uh, traffic was backed up 11 miles uh, while they were mowing down the center strip of the interstate. So uh, I, I, I'm a little frustrated. Actually, it happened during uh, rush hour. So uh, you have many, many Minnesotans that were caught up in traffic while we were watching the mowing uh, taking place down the interstate. Uh, and with that, I, I just observed over the years of, of what all is entailed in that. And many times there's a, a mowing vehicle, and there's a couple more vehicles behind that, and there's a couple more vehicles behind that. And uh, there's a lot of uh, manpower going into mowing along these uh, uh, areas. And I just thought there's, there must be a better way to do this, uh, uh, to do it somehow so we weren't backing up traffic, we weren't uh, using all the, the workforce to do that. Obviously, as we see nowadays, workforce is tougher and tougher to get. And so this bill uh, tries to attempt to uh, maybe motivate uh, MnDOT to look at the autonomous mowing uh, capabilities. I understand, I've talked to some of the MnDOT officials, I think they're, they're doing some of it in the metro where some real steep inclines are, where they're doing it with a, uh, uh, a remote controlled uh, track system that does that. And this just kind of follows along that. Uh, so I introduced the bill to try and uh, help alleviate some of the traffic concerns, workforce issues, and uh, basically put it along Interstate 35 as a test area uh, to try it out because that's where I experienced it and I thought it would be a good place to start. It's a nice straight line. And so with that, I introduced uh, Senate File 5142. Uh, I want to thank uh, staff for working on this. Mr. Greenfield's put a lot of time into this bill to try and get the language uh, to where it's acceptable. And uh, with that, I would stand for questions. And uh, Senator Drzezinski, did you want to offer the A3? Kind of, but not really. <laughs> Is that a good answer? But uh, I, I, We've worked with MnDOT. Our, our staff has worked them. They're, they're obviously not um, super uh, excited about the language that's in the bill, so that would be some compromised language. Uh, but I, maybe I just have some discussion with them before I offer that amendment to what their concerns are. Uh, the, you know, I know the technology is, is coming along. Uh, I've actually I talked with a company that actually has a robotic uh, vehicles that build solar fields, and they do it uh, with GPS and, and goes through the whole thing, and they can uh, program that to do that. And I've talked with them again today, uh, and they said it's getting very close to where something could actually be done. They would actually fly a drone, take GPS points, uh, put 12 cameras on a mower, uh, and they're, they're, the distance they can uh, detect, and off that is one to two centimeters away. So they could detect things from 20 meters away. So it would have safety issues and things like that. Uh, so with that, I'd rather have the discussion of 5142 before uh, we go into a possible amendment. Uh, so with that, I'd open it up for any questions or if MnDOT would like to talk about it. So Great. Thanks. Yeah, we can hold off. There's time enough to work on this. So we'll, we just will let the A3 rest for the, for the time being. And yes, we'll invite Mr. Dukic forward. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, John Dukic with MnDOT Government Affairs, and I guess I'd like to begin by thanking Senator Jasinski for uh, working with us on, on some language uh, and potentially reluctantly offering the <laughs> an amendment. Um, I guess I'd just begin by, by saying that, um, you know, we, we appreciate the spirit of uh, uh, what Senator Jasinski is trying to do with the legislation. We have some concerns you know, primarily with safety around, um, you know, putting an autonomous vehicle into our right of way and attempting to, you know, cut the, you know, potentially lengthy grass in the right of way. Uh, sometimes there's unknown debris in the right of way and uh, things that, you know, human beings have trouble seeing, uh, let alone um, an autonomous vehicle with, uh, you know, imperfect, uh, LIDAR or other technology that can't see, you know, potentially, uh, you know, dead animals in the right of way or propane tanks, other debris that could be hazardous to, um, 
you know, the vehicle as well as the, the traveling public. And so that's our, our primary concern, I'd say. Um, you know, the technology isn't quite there yet to, to do a fully autonomous uh, mowing in, in the ditch. Um, we project it's about five to 10 years away at, at probably at best. Um, the commercial technology just isn't there. And, um, you know, with that and with some of the safety concerns, I think that's, that's primarily where, um, you know where where we'd like to to move away from from uh, you know doing a, a a pilot program and 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 you know, hopefully uh, you know, do some more research on this topic um, and report back to the legislature about what's available and kind of potentially a timeline for you know when um, when an autonomous uh, mowing program could be feasible. Have you thought of hiring uh, herds of goats? But <laughs> the park board does. That, that, that'd be quite the herd, uh, yeah. <laughs> Senator. So, uh, questions, members? Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious as to right now, what's the, maybe run me down top to bottom, how does ditch mowing uh, along 35 work now? Do they, I'm assuming they mow during daylight hours? Uh, I don't know. Give me the rundown. How does it work? Mr. Dukic or yeah, this, anyone else who, uh, yeah, Senator, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. Uh, from what I understand, uh, we tend to mow the, the right of way along 35, maybe twice a year. Um, I think we try to do it at night, but because it's, as I mentioned, it's difficult to see, uh, debris in the right of way and in the tall grass, you know, that shifts from nighttime to daytime mowing, um, which, you know, can in turn create some backup as Senator Jasinski had mentioned. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I guess the, uh, you know, as I drive up 94 more often than 35, as I drive up 94, there's a section up there that I uh, mentioned to Zizinski a little earlier about that's three lanes wide. I think they test paint or they do things in that yeah, area, uh, yeah. northwest of Monticello. It seems like maybe that's a good spot to test your autonomous mowers and or they won't run in any cars or be in any way. So um, I don't know. I think it's interesting. That's the... Uh, the test track they have up there. It's a world-renowned uh, facility. You get people from around the world to, to come up and drive the figure eight up there. So. All right, uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I, I know that on, I live right near 23, and I know that's not an interstate, but it seems like all the ditches there get bailed. And so is there a prohibition about bailing the interstate or you know the, tra the traffic doesn't flow quite as fast on a on a divided highway of 23 but it's still the same principle of, of divided highway and we have farmers bailing that right away so why is why do we have state employees doing one and farmers doing another Mr. Dukic this is the, uh, now we're opening up the can of worms on ditch mowing. <laughs> uh, is, there, is there a different policy for uh, interstates versus trunk highways and county roads on using the grass along the sides for hay? Yeah, Senator, uh, Dibble, Senator Howe, um, you know, I can check and get back to you, but my sense is that, you know, county roads are, are Governed by the the county authorities, same with city roads, and MnDOT has a it's you know this is State Highway 23. Govern oh, you're, you're, sorry, oh. you're referring to State Highway 23. The commissioner is commissioner maybe, knows maybe, the maybe answer. We have a different uh, different response here. <laughs> <laughs> bailing out her legislative liaison here. I like this. <laughs> she comes from the from the front lines, though. She knows her stuff. Welcome, commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I think uh, the first question I heard had to do with mowing on the interstate. And uh, interstates have what we call controlled access. So um, we do not uh, authorize permits for the farmers to mow on our highways that have controlled access. So that needs to be MnDOT doing the mowing on controlled access highways. And is there a reason for that? Senator Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is, is, Commissioner, is there a reason for that? I mean, it's a controlled access, but they can still get on and 
and bail all the way to the next access point or as much as they want and then I guess uh, and it, to me they've got there's more right of way there on most of the interstates out in the rural areas than there are on a state highway. But uh, I was just, uh, it, it seems a little inconsistent. And But I, you know, and I would think that if you can use a tractor and a baler out there and a, and a hay bind, I would think that uh, a autonomous mower would be probably less intrusive than having all that traffic on there. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe. Um, primarily when it comes to a controlled access highway, there's controlled access for a number of reasons, but the reason we wouldn't allow permits has to do with safety, and there are other, other issues there too, um, and we can get some additional information to you on that. One other thing I'd, I'd mention too about um, our interstates and other controlled access highways is we have identified areas where we're growing pollinator habitat on there, which helps us out with our commitments as part of a, a monarch conservancy, which um, will help us with future projects where monarchs um, are known to be um, threatened or endangered, and uh, that helps us with being able to move projects forward because of having some pollinator habitat. So that's just one example of another reason um, that we wouldn't want to, um, farmers, say, for instance, mowing on our interstates in certain areas. Anyway. Senator Al. Well, I, I, I sometimes wonder about putting uh, butterfly habitat next to traffic doing 70 miles an hour and causing more windshields to be uh, washed but uh, I sometimes think that that'd be better off in a in a set aside acres for uh, wildlife production or something like that but uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave that to another discussion so thank you mr. chair sounds like a great uh, Lassard Sam's initiative senator Lang <laughs> talk to your friend senator Howe there and uh, all right uh, members, anything further on uh, Senate File 5142? All right. I looked for a, like a Roomba book to give to you. I'm right. sure so you did. <laughs> couldn't <laughs> find one yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Um, Chair, uh, just last comments. I'll work with MnDOT to see if we can come up with some resolve. Uh, so uh, after this time I'd offer the A3, which basically would do a report uh, on looking in the feasibility of it. Uh, so I'd offer the A3. All right, and uh, I have an amendment to the amendment as well, a, a verbal amendment, uh, but I'll offer the A3 first. All right. Senator Jasinski offers the A3. So in your packets, questions, members? All right. All in favor of the A3, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Then I would offer a verbal amendment uh, to correct on line 1.28, uh, cross out the word determine, and put in... Uh, or just cross out the line determine. Uh, so it would read uh, the research must analyze whether an automated mower can operate safely instead of must analyze determine. Uh, so just a technical a small amendment there. All right. Uh, so Senator Chesinski uh, offers the oral amendment to delete the word determine on line 1.28. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Um, and then a uh, question to Ms. Boyd. Um, does the A3 amendment make the fiscal note moot at this point? Mr. Chair, um, I believe the vast majority of it would be moot. Um, it assumed a two-year pilot project, which involves some staffing um, and other costs, and that would have to be reevaluated for the, just the, the study and the report. Great. Thank you. All right. Anything further, members? Anything further? Um, Mr. Senators. Chair, again, I'll work with MnDOT. Again, I think it, it just looking at how it's done, I think there's probably a more efficient way to do it um, and, and watching how it affects traffic. And uh, as we look at farther in the future with manpower and those things, I just think it's something we could look at. And, and as technology advances, I think we're getting closer and closer. I think we're closer than five years, to be uh, honest. But uh, we'll work through that with MnDOT and see where we come with this report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. With that, uh, we will lay Senate File 5142 as amended on the table for possible inclusion in a future supplemental fiscal omnibus bill. Moving on, Senator Drzezinski to Senate File 4899, Small Cities. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate file number 4899, uh, as you well know, we've talked about on this committee as well. Uh, last uh, cycle, we were able to uh, get funding, ongoing funding for small cities. However, uh, with that and the delay of the TAA, uh, they basically have a hole in their budget where they're not getting as much money as, as needed. Uh, so what this would do would be a one-time appropriation of $25 million in fiscal year 2025 uh, to kind of fill that gap until the uh, permanent and ongoing funding kicks in. Uh, but I do also have an A1, a technical amendment uh, that I've been told that it needs to be done to make the bill in its appropriate form. So with that, I'd offer the A1 amendment. Senator Dzinski offers the A1 amendment to Senate File 4899. Questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Senator Dzinski. Um, and we have some people ready to testify. All right. So... Uh, are we starting with, are you Mr. Dahl? Why don't you uh, please, actually why don't, uh, uh, I see Mr. Hawkinson was queued up there and he's first on the list uh, and he's remote. Um, so we'll go with John Hawkinson, the mayor of Olivia. Thank you, Chair and members. I'm John Hawkinson representing the community of Olivia, Minnesota as mayor and also speaking for small cities across the state in favor of Senate file 4899. Uh, thank you, Senators Jelinski and Dibble, for introducing this bill. It is much appreciated because uh, small cities like Olivia are tasked to provide our citizens with safe and navigable streets to facilitate the day-to-day -day activities that drive our collective economic and community well-being. Uh, we're faced with the same challenges that exist for larger cities in this climate and uh, diligently plan for smart ways to maintain our transportation infrastructure. Uh, Senate file 4899 will help us carry out maintenance in a more suitable manner. Um, you know, in the world of road systems, investing in maintenance upfront and in a more comprehensive manner is exponentially more financially sustainable than allowing problems to compound until they become more costly repair initiatives. Uh, this invest investment, as, as originally understood, and as timely execution uh, will absolutely be the wisest path, for, path forward for maintaining safe and passable street infrastructure for small cities like ours. Um, the changes that negatively impacted our assistance uh, would significantly compound the financial challenges that we're faced with when serving our community's transportation needs. Um, we would all be wise stewards of this assistance uh, by applying to our mutual consistence needs um, you know, at the level that was initially committed. Uh, due to the Department adjust adjustments uh, to the previous Small Cities Transportation Assistance Bill, uh, some 700 cities were basically phased out of the plan, and my community's assistance went down from approximately $64,000 to $8,000, which uh, dramatically limited the impact of our assistance. Um, the people of Minnesota will have a better return if this bill passes, and uh, we're just simply asking for better assistance uh, to serve the same people, you know, we all here in this meeting are called to serve. And with that, I thank you again, uh, Chair and Committee, for uh, hearing me out today. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor. Appreciate your testimony. Um, now we'll go to Mr. Dahl from Wyzetta. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Committee members. Um, Thank you, uh, Senator Jasinski, for your support of this bill, and thank you, uh, Senator Morrison, for your support last year uh, in authorship. Uh, my name is Jeff Dahl. I'm the city manager for the city of Wyzetta. Uh, nobody usually, through as my eight years as city manager, it's very hard to get people to really uh, care too much about Wyzetta, the hardships of Wyzetta, but hear me out. Uh, I think we have a pretty compelling pick, uh, case. Uh, Wyzetta does have the same pressures as larger communities, especially in the metro area. Um, we're a robust, active community, uh, but like small cities like the mayor just mentioned, uh, we, do, we have limited access to resources. Uh, Wyzetta gets no LGA. We are one of the highest percentage contributors uh, from a fiscal disparities perspective. We barely fall under that 5,000 population threshold, despite our community having service demands and an employee base more akin to uh, Stillwater or Hopkins. Last year, we were also unsuccessful in secure, securing legislative approval to move forward with a local food and beverage sales tax to assist in funding the local service and infrastructure needs that result with having so much traffic and activity, uh, infrastructure needs such as roads. 
All this to say is why we're so grateful for the legislative action that was taken last year for the small cities, um, for small cities and transportation in general. Uh, we, like one of the, like all the other small cities, are now planning to receive the funds. Where they're planned in our our, our CIPs uh, and have uh, allocated those funds into the future. Uh, so we're really expecting those. If the funding is cut or delayed, this will have a negative impact on our roads, which as a regional destination like we are, uh, it will have implications throughout the metro area and state. So as such, we are in support of uh, House File uh, 4872 and really appreciate your time, Senator Dibble and committee members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dahl. Uh, welcome, Mr. O'Rourke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Cap O'Rourke. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Association of Small Cities. Um, to put this, to clarify why we are here today, last session, uh, this committee uh, created the TAA, and in, in, as part of that, we include small cities to receive, for the first time ever, ongoing dedicated funding. We were happy with that. We um, did have concerns in the initial biennium, but we were really happy that, about the growth factor that was going to take place in the out years. Historically, this account has been funded with one-time money. The Department of Transportation has determined the allotments per city, has made that announcement, and then they go out. Um, as a result of this being ongoing revenue, the Department of Transportation took a different approach this year, and they determined that they wanted to collect all the revenue before uh, making the allocations. Small cities get their allocation at the same time that we get LGA, so those happen at the July payment and the December payment. And what that means is that we get ours at the tail end of our calendar year and at the beginning of the state's fiscal year. So by having to wait a full year to collect the revenues before making the payments, what was becoming apparent uh, last fall was that our cities, despite seeing on the spreadsheets that there was a fiscal year 24 payment, we were not going to get that December payment. So we will be getting our first payment of these monies in fiscal year 25, which will be July of 24 calendar year. And it's, it's essentially a delay. So on the spreadsheet that was passed out of conference committee last year, there was a 3 million in fiscal year 24 and a 19.9 in fiscal year 25. That is effectively not the case anymore. It is a zero in fiscal year 24, and it now looks like it's a 2.5 in fiscal year 25. It's a reduction of over $20 million to our small cities. Many of these small cities were expecting this money. Many of these small cities have started to plan how to use it. Many of them have actually budgeted for it, and they are going to have to fix a hole in their budget. Senate file 4899 replaces that money and it also clarifies that the entire amount will be spent in July of this calendar year, but it would be the first payment of fiscal year 25. The reason for that is to give the cities to be able to use this money and allocate it in this calendar year, which they had been expecting to do as a result of last year's uh, conference committee and, and transportation report. Thank you. And I see we have uh, questions for Mr. O'Rourke. Uh, and we have Ms. Finn. Ready. Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ann Finn. I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. We are a statewide association representing 838 of Minnesota's 855 cities. I want to thank Senator Jasinski for offering uh, Senate file 4899 and Chair Dibble for being a co-author. Cities with populations below 5,000 are not included in the constitutional formula that distributes revenues flowing from the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. This means more than 700 of Minnesota cities do not directly benefit from the HUDTF and rely primarily on property taxes and special assessments and local government aid, of course, to fund their streets. The Small Cities Assistance Account was established in 2015 and has been very helpful in funding roads in cities with 700 uh, cities uh, 700 cities throughout the state. Between 2015 and 2021, the Small Cities Assistance Program was funded only four times, and each year we filled calls asking if Small Cities Assistance will be coming to the cities. The League has consistently requested that funding for the program be made permanent and be made part of the state's transportation budget so small cities can plan for spending the funds. 
Last year, that became a reality with the creation of the Transportation Advancement Account. Unfortunately, due to delayed effective dates and a phase in of the revenue sources that will fund the Transportation Advancement Account, without this bill, meaningful funds will not flow to, to small cities until 2026. This bill is extremely important to the vast majority of cities in Minnesota, and I can tell you from conversations I've had with many city officials around the state that they would appreciate you supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Finn. Questions? All right. Uh, anything further before we take the discussion to the committee, Senator Zinsky? All right, members, uh, questions, comments, amendments? All right. Um, I'll just say, uh, for my part, uh, I'm a co-author on this bill. Senator Morrison is, or will be soon, a co-author on this bill. Um, uh, and uh, this is, you know, of course, work that uh, I'm committed to. I know um, my counterpart in the other body um, uh, also is committed to uh, figuring out what we can do. Despite our two million one time uh, target, uh, we're going to think creatively. We're going to get something done here. So appreciate uh, the discussion. Appreciate your bringing the bill, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also want to thank Senator Howe, who was involved in this process as well uh, last year uh, to get this funding going as well. So uh, thank him as well, uh, as well as you and Senator Morrison. So thank you. And Senator Lang produced as a mayor to help us make the case. So and Senator that. Lang, great. <laughs> I think there's room for all of you on the bill. So all right. We'll get you on there. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, so with that, um, we will lay Senate File 4899 as amended on the table for uh, consideration of a future, in a future omnibus finance bill. All right, so I'm back. Senator Double, welcome back. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So um, if we could go to Senate File 3605. Um, similar to the discussion that we just had, what Senate File 3605 would do is uh, uh, designate some resources for our local road improvement fund, our local road improvement program, the LRIP, as well as the local bridge replacement program, the LBRP. Um, in the amounts of $200 million each. Um, and just, we have folks who are here to testify, and so they'll say it better than I will. Um, but um, I, I often talk about the fact that 80 or 85% of the mileage in Minnesota is under the control of local units of government. Um, and uh, much of that uh, mileage doesn't benefit from the high user tax distribution fund. Um, it's very reliant on property tax. I've just heard Ann Finn and others talk ab about that. Um, and Minnesota has either the fourth or the fifth uh, largest number of lane miles in the country, not on a per capita basis. Those are, those are lane miles. Whether we're talking about lane miles or center lane miles, um, we have one of the most robust roadway system in the country, which has a lot to do with the success, the economic success of our communities. But it's really, really expensive uh, to, to keep those up. And so we, while we had a major leap forward last year in the resources that we're putting on the table, some of which flow through the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, some of which are going into the Transportation Advancement Account, um, we still have uh, a need to, to, to you know, specifically fund the LRIP and the LPRP, um, which are you know, competitive grants. They're not, they don't go out on a formula basis, um, and then they, they fulfill certain programmatic and other criteria. Um, and so with that, uh, Madam Chair, um, I, think, I think the goal of this bill is to move it on to capital investments and persuade um, the bonding committee, on which Senator Jesus and I serve, um, uh, to, to create a very strong position in the bonding bill for this very essential local infrastructure. So that's what I, oh, and I have an amendment. Senator Dibble, I was going to say, I think you yeah. have an amendment, the A1. Yeah. So the A1 um, uh, is, I think, language that uh, makes this bill consistent with how we describe and how we've passed this particular program, these program funds in previous years. So it's just bringing the bill into consistent, uh, in consistency with, with how we've construed these funds in years past. Um, 
Ms. Boyd, did you have anything to add to that? That's yeah. Um, Ms. Boyd does not. Ms. Donahoe <laughs> brought this to our attention, and so we responded with, with this amendment. So I move the A1 amendment. Okay, Senator Double moves the A1. All in favor of the A1, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The A1 is adopted. Senator Dibble. Um, so we have a few folks who would like to testify, if you would like to call them forward, Madam Chair. Very good. I th we have Ryan Thilgies, hopefully I pronounced that right, um, Margaret Donahoe, please come to the testifier's table. Uh, Mr. Thilgies, please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair, members of the Senate Transportation Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today regarding Senate File 3605. My name is Ryan Tilgis. I am the Blue Earth County Engineer and Public Works Director. The Association of Minnesota Counties and the Minnesota County Engineers Association are highly supportive of the proposed $200 million in bonds for both the local bridge replacement program and the local road improvement program. Both programs are tremendously effective at providing much needed one-time road and bridge investment equitably across the state for counties, cities, and townships that struggle to be able to fully fund replacement or improvement of their degraded significant infrastructure on state aid and local routes. These programs fund a portion of the project construction costs only with project engineering and administration costs paid by local, uh, local or other sources. The local road improvement program has been very popular with local agencies by providing state funds to leverage local funding, making critical projects a reality. During the solicitation of the most recent $103 million appropriation in 2023, Minnesota Department of Transportation state aid received 378 applications requesting $417 million in program funds. The total construction cost for those projects was estimated at $922 million meaning that the state funds make up approximately 45% of the construction costs with 55% coming from other sources. I personally would like to thank the legislature because Blue Earth County was recently notified that we will receive $1.5 million for the reconstruction of County State at Highway 82, which is Victory Drive in Mankato. This project includes safety improvements and new traffic signals at the intersection with Hoffman Road in Mankato. Victory Drive is a central arterial roadway carrying over 17,000 vehicles per day, and Hoffman Road carries over 7,000 vehicles per day. This corridor serves several businesses and Mankato East High School. This grant greatly helps fund this joint city and county project, providing 43% of the total project cost. With this additional funding, we can now use other local funds to replace several failing large culverts that are not eligible for state bridge bonding. We're also hopeful to be able to replace an additional farm to market bridge with some of those local funds that are now made available because of this grant. Without the LRIP funds, those additional projects would not simply be possible, meaning that the funds for a project in Mankato helps benefit rural areas in Blue Earth County as well. The local bridge replacement program is another program that's vital to transportation in rural Minnesota. In 2023, there were 112 bridge projects on the local system that received $48 million. These projects leverage an additional $75 million in local, state aid, and federal funds for a total construction cost of $123 million. State bridge funds made up 39% and other funds made up 61%. As of, the March 20, as of March 27th, there was $26 million remaining from the 2023 allocation, which is expected to be depleted by midsummer. Statewide, over the next five years, local agencies have identified 948 priority bridge replacement projects requesting $282 million in state bridge funds, with $740 million in total construction costs. Again, the state funding request represents 38% of the total construction costs. The most recent Blue Earth County resolution for bridge replacement has identified $26.7 million of bridge replacement projects for 38 total projects over the next 10 to 15 years. A steady funding stream for local bridges ensures consistent and timely replacement of severely deteriorated or obsolete bridges across the straight state, as well as ensuring a consistent workforce for bridge design and contractor workforces. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak on behalf of this important bill, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Donahoe, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Margaret Donahoe, Executive Director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. Uh, the Transportation Alliance includes counties, cities, townships, as well as the transportation industry, labor, uh, transit systems, and other businesses. I would like to thank Senator Dibble for authoring this legislation and for supporting these programs for many years. Uh, and also Senator Jasinski for being co-author and also being a strong champion for local road and bridge funding. Um, as you've heard, the local bridge replacement program created in 1976 um, has been really critical and has been included in almost every capital bonding bill uh, to support local governments in their efforts to maintain these key connections because for some local governments, a bridge project can be a really expensive local project. And uh, having that state portion of the funding has been really important. In our state, we have a lot of bridges. 15,732 bridge structures are on the local system. And of this number, 10,082 bridges are on the city and county systems and 735 of these are eligible for replacement based on condition ratings right now. A five-year master bridge list is maintained, so local governments do make a commitment to these bridges, and there's a priority for how these projects will get done. The stability of having this program funded consistently has been really critical. Um, and so we really rely on the bonding bill for this because the program is not funded out of the Highway Trust Fund on a regular basis. Uh, since 2014, a total of 310 million has been provided in bond funds for uh, local bridges. And as you heard, these state funds are supplemented with federal funds and local funds so that the state dollars really go so much farther. Uh, and once the bridge project is completed, local governments do maintain these structures. We're not aware of any bridge projects uh, once completed that have received funding from the local bridge program again. So they get funding once and then the local governments take care of them. Uh, the local road improvement program created in 2002 um, again, recognizes how difficult it can be for local governments to maintain local roads and also to come up with the local match for trunk highway projects. Since 2014, the legislature has provided approximately 900 million uh, for the local road improvement program with an average of 112.5 million in the years the program was funded. Again, these bond funds leverage federal dollars, local dollars, and make sure that these projects can happen. Um, so overall, uh, funding for these programs has always been done on a bipartisan basis. It's been an important part of the capital bonding bill. And so on behalf of the Alliance, I urge your support for the funding in this bill. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Novak, welcome. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, <coughs> members of the committee. Steve Novak is my name. I handle transportation for the Minnesota Inter-County Association, uh, which is four of the five suburban counties and 11 of the greater Minnesota counties around the state, about 35% of the state's population. Um, we're here today to uh, gladly support uh, Senate File 3605, which essentially reflects our platform position on the funding of road and bridges for the 2024 uh, legislative session and we believe that the 200 million dollars for the local roads and 200 million dollars for local bridges is a, a, a very good and appropriate uh, number to continue the progress that was made last year in 2023 on transportation funding overall so take this opportunity to thank the uh, chair who was chief author of the bill last year but also make note of the fact on this legislation Senator Jasinski and uh, uh, to repeat the idea that we're pleased to have bipartisan authorship on, on, on this particular provision. So this is a straightforward bill. I just gave a straightforward answer, and with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Uh, welcome to the testifier's table, Ms. Finn. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ann Finn. I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. We are a statewide association representing 835 of Minnesota's 855 cities. 
like the testifiers before me, I want to thank Chair Dibble for carrying this legislation and also thank uh, Lee Jasinski for co-authoring it. It sends a very strong message when we have bipartisan support for these kinds of bills. The League of Minnesota Cities strongly supports Senate File 3605, a bill that would provide a combined $400 million for the local road improvement program and the local bridge replacement and rehabilitation account. These programs provide critical funding for transportation infrastructure in cities of all sizes. Minnesota has more than 141,000 miles of roadway and more than 22,500 of these miles are owned and maintained by Minnesota's 855 cities. Cities have limited tools to fund transportation infrastructure and most of this infrastructure is currently funded with property tax dollars. If enacted, Senate File 3605 would provide property tax relief in the communities that are successful in the solicitation process and we would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on Senate File 3605 as amended? Okay, members, discussion. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble. This is a great bill, and I'm uh, proud to be uh, next to your name on this as well. I know there's a, it, this is the way things should be done. It should be done on a bipartisan support. And, and I think MnDOT, from what I read, uh, recommended about $480 million for the bridge program and $500 million for, uh, for LREP over the next three years. So basically a billion dollars every year for the next three years. I think that's to get caught up. My question is, why didn't the governor put any money? He's got zero dollars in for our roads and bridges. It just astonishes me. He talks about one Minnesota and uh, a bipartisan infrastructure bill and puts zero in for our roads and bridges. So maybe you've talked to him. I, I guess I want to know why he put zero in his bill. Is it, is it some type of a negotiating tool or what's going on? But to put zero dollars into what Minnesotans need is crazy. So maybe you can answer that or someone from MnDOT or someone from the governor's office, but why would you put zero in there? Well, just... I don't see the governor in the room, but Senator Dibble, <laughs> would you like to comment? Uh, thank you. I'd... I, I will uh, I will demur. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a fair Members. question. Senator Jasinski, are you? Do you have more you'd like to share? Uh, no, I'm, my other members probably. It just it it just shocks me that we have zero dollars in the governor recommendation for what is truly and honestly knit, needed in Minnesota to transfer commerce, uh, people across the state, uh, you name it. Uh, our roads and bridges are so important, and, and to put a zero dollar in uh, for an infrastructure bill just just, I'm astonished at. So with that, I'll let other members ask other questions. Other discussion members. Okay. So Madam Chair, I will renew or I will make a motion um, to recommend that uh, 3605, Senate File 3605 as amended be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Capital Investments. Excellent. Members, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay? Okay, Senate File 3605 as amended is passed and is referred to the Committee on Capital Investment. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Next up, 4267. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, a delete everything amendment for Senate File 4267. Okay, Senator Dibble offers, is this the A1? The A1 amendment. Yes, the A1, excuse me. And Madam Chair, this is a, a function of um, some conversation and negotiation that has been held between um, uh, a couple of cities and a couple of counties with the Metropolitan Council. I, I, I don't want to represent that it's universally supported, but it's closer to uh, a, a compromise than, than before. Okay, so would you like to adopt the amendment and yes, then we can and proceed? Yes, so I move the A1. Okay, members, all in favor of the A1, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The A1 is adopted. Senator Dibble. Um, so, uh, Madam Chair, members, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to present Senate File 4267. I'd also like to thank my co-authors, Senators Herr and Carlson. Uh, and uh, very quickly, um, you know, we, of course, ma you know, made a historic investment in our transportation infrastructure, including transit in the metropolitan area. Um, for very important reasons to uh, 
make sure people have access to jobs, uh, reduce disparities, provide travel options to all kinds of, of opportunities, much like we just discussed in my previous bill on, on uh, displacements. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Met Council is in, in a really strong position now. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, there was going to be a very robust network of uh, bus rapid transit lines uh, throughout the metropolitan area. Um, it's going to create the kind of connectivity that's going to support the local bus route uh, regular scheduled service is going to replace uh, some of those in the in the uh, uh, major corridors, or it's going to complement those. Um, and this is a, a bill that's meant to address an uh, issue of longstanding. It's going to be similar to a conversation we'll be having in this committee in a few days with a bill that Senator Drudasinski has, um, in which uh, when trunk highway projects come through a local community, um, there's a local cost participation. Sometimes what happens is the local community ends up picking up some elements of that trunk highway fund or trunk highway project that really, by all rights, uh, should be picked up uh, by the state of Minnesota. Um, and, and so what this is an attempt to do is recognize that uh, but for bus rapid transit coming through a particular area, uh, some of these things that, that are triggered um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't occur. And, and they absolutely have to happen. Mostly uh, what I'm focused on in this bill um, is, are all the accessibility elements to make sure that everyone uh, can move through the community to get to transit, to use it to, to where they need to go. And for whatever reason that I don't fully understand, for many years, those were deemed to be enhancements or the responsibility of local units of government. Um, and in fact, they really are essential elements of these transit improvements and they should be a part of that entire project in the capital and it be a part of the capital uh, budget for bus rapid transit. So that is the aspiration and the goal of this, uh, and it's in recognition of the fact that uh, Met Metro Transit maybe not need to stretch its dollars quite as far because it's going to have the resources to build these transit facilities the way they should. So with that, we have a few folks who would like to testify. Yes, Senator Double, I do have... Uh a list of testifiers here. It looks like Lisa Cerny from Hennepin County Public Works and Brian Dodds from City of Minneapolis Public Works. Please come to the testifiers table. Welcome. Please, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair and Senators, my name is Lisa Cerny and I am the Assistant County Administrator for the Hennepin County Public Works Department. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Hennepin County is a champion for improving our regional transit system to better serve Minnesotans with convenient and efficient access. This is, a, this is critical to provide a more equitable transportation system to meet our, our collective climate action goals and reduce vehicle miles traveled. To meet these goals, we are here with our local government partners to seek a more holistic approach as Senator Dibble mentioned, in building arterial BRT projects. As you can see in this photo, the current scope of Metro Transit arterial BRT work is focused on station areas and, and does not include all of the quadrants at intersections. This image is an example that shows ADA upgrades at one of the D-line stations and ADA upgrades are also needed on the opposite corner to provide the access for all transit users. Hennepin County and local governments work to align our capital projects with ABRT pro projects to fund safety and multimodal improvements in these corridors. A recent example under construction now is the B line along Lake Street in South Minneapolis. This is a vibrant and diverse corridor that serves as the main east-west artery for thousands of residents every day, and a corridor with, an with above average crash rates at many busy intersections. The image shows the current, this image shows the current configuration of Lake Street. For this project, our goal is to transform this into a corridor where all users feel safe and where businesses can thrive. The county and city invested tens of millions and secured a $12 million federal raise grant to significantly improve the corridor. The project includes accessibility upgrades, traffic signal revisions, lane adjustments, and pavement 
resurfacing. We analyzed how to improve access and transit reliability. The project today includes converting some travel lanes to dedicated transit lanes, which we believe will make the average transit trip 20% faster. That's how we get more people in buses. This is the type of transit specific improvements that should be included in the original project scope. With the inter introduction of the dedicated transit lanes, we needed to make changes to the signal systems. You can kind of see the top is the existing, what we call cross section, the bottom is the, is the what will be in the future. We needed to, so therefore we needed to make changes in the signals. Again, these improvements should be included in the ABRT project scope. The region needs strong leadership to ensure BRT projects are done right and best to serve residents with quality transit. We have been able to do that in some of the corridors thanks to federal funding, but that is not a guarantee or likely for every corridor going forward. Our local governments share our concerns, Ramsey County, Anoka County, City of Minneapolis, City of St. Paul, City of Fridley, collectively believe that Metro Transit needs to include station ADA accessibility and transit specific infrastructure in ABRT scope. We want to thank Met Council for working collaboratively on this language and hope to continue those conversations. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Brian Dodds. I'm Deputy Director and City Engineer for Minneapolis Public Works. I am here to express support for Senate File 4267 as amended relating to the scoping and funding of ADA upgrades and transit priority with bus rapid transit projects. Metro Transit's plan to implement arterial BRT projects as laid out in their Network Next study overlaps with some of Minneapolis's busiest corridors. These transit investments build a faster, more effective transit network and Minneapolis supports, supports bus rapid transit projects. Uh, these corridors have high volumes of people. They're walking, rolling, biking, driving, and many are identified as our Vision Zero high injury streets uh, with documented safety needs. To deliver a BRT project that meets the needs of those trying to get to and from the transit line, residents, workers, visitors, local jurisdictions have been contributing substantial local funding to meet minimum requirements to provide fully accessible intersections and connections to planned stations. This bill would fill some of those funding gaps that local agencies have had to fill. This bill would also require Metro Transit BRT projects to pay for needed uh, transit priority investments that are key to shorter travel times, a more reliable trip, and higher ridership. Local agencies have relied upon, have been relied upon to fill pedestrian accessibility and transit priority funding gaps at the expense of other programs and due to funding constraints, may not be implemented consistently. Pedestrian accessibility and transit priority improvements should be funded with the project to make strong connections to rider destinations and allow riders to get there efficiently and consistently. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Judge Shetnan and Nick Thompson, please come forward to the testifier's table. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Judd Shetnan. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Metropolitan Council and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this bill. Um, as the testifiers uh, have previously stated, we have had a number of conversations with the cities and counties related to, to this language and we believe that the language itself is improved quite a bit. We asked uh, to see that there would be an effective date included, which there is. Uh, we also talked about not having to have the language um, make currently compliant uh, sections of those intersections have to be um, upgraded to the ADA standards. However, one of the concerns that we have relates to the cost of this, and I know that there's been a fiscal note uh, requested for this. And the way that the council <clears throat> has brought forward requests, or our request related to ABRT is last year when we were working on the transportation bill, we always said that we would uh, be coming back to the legislature for support related to the capital construction of these projects. The use of the sales tax priorities, there were uh, a number of them that related to ABRT and BRT that talked about the um, planning and uh, delivery of the 
ABRT lines, but then also the operations and the uh, maintenance, capital maintenance of those ABRT lines. It did not suggest the funding of the use of the sales tax in order to fund the capital costs of these of these projects. And for a project like the H line, which would be the next ABRT line that is um, coming forward, we believe those costs would be very substantial. We think that's probably in the range of, uh, I mean, with the amendment, we think it's probably in the range of 30 to $35 million, depending on, on um, how you would look at that. It incl that includes the transit signal priority language. It also includes the red paint, but then uh, taking over um, and, and improving those station, excuse me, those intersections where they are kitty corner to where our stations or stops are. And so just to be clear, like currently the local road authority is responsible for those. And that, and this is a transfer of that responsibility onto the project. And when I mentioned the uh, how we are bringing forward our requests related to ABRT. Again, we see the H line uh, that we've made a request for. Um, the local share for that is around $75 million. Governor's recommended $37 million in his bonding bill. Uh, we would expect to ask for the balance of that in the future bonding bill. And then we would ask, uh, if this were to move forward, we would ask for um, those additional costs to be added on top of that, which again, we believe are, are substantial. The, the language doesn't, it says the Met Council, it doesn't necessarily say where. So I wanted to make sure that the, that the committee understood that how we've approached this is through, is through bonding. And one of the concerns there is that we are hoping to bring forward the J, K, and L lines. And when we add those costs to that, we just slow down the delivery of those, um, of, of those projects. But again, when the sales tax was passed last year, and it was a historic bill, and it was absolutely historic. We appreciate all the work that Senator Dibble, Representative Hornstein, the, the committees, the conferees did on this. This is a major change for us moving forward. It is amazing for us. Um, but how the, this change is being funded is a really big deal for us, and so we just need to see how all of that shakes out, because if the intention is to have us pay for this either through bonding or through the sales tax, uh, we just need to make sure we, we talk about that because that is uh, problematic for us. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair, committee members, Nick Thompson with Capital Projects at Metro Transit. I'll stand for questions. Uh, nothing further to add to them, what Mr. Shetnan stated. Okay, then I think we have one more testifier on the list. Um, Tim Marino, will you come forward to testify, please? Welcome back. Well, I hope you aren't sick of me yet. <laughs> Please state your name for the record and proceed. My name is Tim Marino, uh, and thank you for allowing me to testify. I think this requirement is very important, and it's much needed to improve pedestrian accessibility along arterial bus rapid transit corridors with shorter crossing distances, wider sidewalks, and refuge, refuge islands. But my only issue is the funding. While the transportation omnibus was much needed funding, it isn't enough due to a lot of the money already being allocated towards new funding obligations. The sales tax is estimated to be 450 million a year. 150 million went towards a fiscal cliff. The omnibus also transferred the responsibility of transit way and operations maintenance from the counties to the Met Council. I haven't found the exact numbers, maybe someone from Met Council could speak to that, what it would be around, but from estimates based on past years, uh, it looks to be approximately 100 million a year. Um, the number would also also increase with more transitways opening in the future, like the green and blue line extensions and the purple Riverview and gold lines. This would only leave approximately 200 million a year for that new funding that has to be spent on 13 priorities every single year. Now, it sounds like a lot of money. Our transit system also has a lot of needs, like a lot of stops without uh, benches and shelters that are also very needed for accessibility. We're also paying more for our bus drivers with operators who are working second or third shift will now be making a starting wage of over $8 an hour higher than it was two years ago, which they definitely do deserve, but it comes back to us being down 400 operators from 2018 levels. Will we have enough money to pay for 400 operators if we are able to get fully funded? We also need to recognize that 2018 shouldn't be the final goal of our transit system. We need to keep striving to make it better in order to really reach our climate goals and to get people out of cars. 
This would add new liabilities to Met Council. My question is, why should the Met Council's limited transit funds be used to pay what the counties and the cities and MnDOT should have already done to upgrade their accessibility and pedestrian safety? Arterial BRT is an improvement over local buses, but they don't provide the same benefits that a transitway does. The, our LRT and dedicated BRTs, like the gold and purple lines, adhere to requirements such as having at least 50% of the route with dedicated lanes in order to access funding from the FTA. They also include more robust reconstructions and upgrades to the streetscape paid for by that federal funding. Adding transit lanes is never easy. It means sacrificing lanes used for cars and parking spaces and requires our electeds to stand up for transit against drivers who are used to being privileged by our infrastructure. In my neighborhood, there is a purple line that is currently being planned. At one of the meetings, an elected along that line brought up that we shouldn't add transit lanes in one section due to community concerns. The project manager responded saying that if transit lanes were taken away, it would have to be downgraded to arterial bus rapid transit and it wouldn't be eligible for federal funding due to that 50% requirement. That quickly changed the tone in the conversation because counties and cities, they all want federal money. There's a term for this in planning circles called BRT creep. This is where BRT lines are proposed, but due to compromises made during the planning process, they lose bus lanes and other bus priorities due to pressure, meaning a less transformative project. If counties and states want additional funding for improving accessibility, they should be held up to higher standards for transit projects and should put more skin in the game. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Dibble, any comments before we move to member discussion? Um, Madam Chair, <clears throat> excuse me. If we could ask Ms. Boyd to just give us a once-over on the fiscal notes. Ms. Boyd. Thank you, Madam Chair. When you're ready. Um, there has been a delete all amendment, so I will stress that, that this fiscal note is written to the introduced version of the bill. Um, so we'll have to look at what is affected in the amendment. But just briefly, um, the estimates from Met Council are that the language of the bill would apply within the forecast period through fiscal year 27, primarily to the H line um, that's in development and would not apply to other projects in development such as the B, E, F, or G lines. Um, and the cost would be related, if you look on page three um, of the fiscal note, the cost drivers are listed near the top. Um, those would be sub sidewalk curb ramps and signals, red transit pavement marking, traffic signal modifications, and then for each of those cost drivers, there would be construction costs, right-of-way costs, and design and construction administration costs for various levels. For instance, 40 intersections would be affected, 132,000 square feet of red pavement marking, and 41 non-station intersections for traffic signal modifications. Um, so there is a grid starting on page four listing all those costs. Um, I will just sum it up that the total cost is estimated to be 42, 42.7 million in fiscal year 27. However, on page uh, six of the fiscal note, um, specify some long-term fiscal considerations. I believe as Mr. Shetnan pointed out, this would also apply in future to the J, K, and L lines um, being developed. Um, and again, we'd have to relook at the fiscal estimates after the amendment, but uh, under this fiscal note, those through, uh, from years 2030 through 2035 would estimate it to be 103.4 million in additional cost. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. And Senator Dibble, I was delinquent in not offering if anyone else wanted to testify on Senate file 4267 as amended. It appears not. Okay, members, discussion. Senator Jasinski. Uh, Madam Chair, and so I just want to make sure I get this right. So when we talk about redoing the bus line, I, I agree with bus rapid transit, but so are we taking lane miles out of service that are currently being used by vehicles, uh, automobiles, personal automobiles? I guess that would be my concern uh, if we're taking those away. Uh, and is that happening more and more, or what are we doing? If you can just talk about that. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Jasinski. Um, uh, I can talk about um, the E-Line that's, that's slated for Hennepin Avenue. Um, we'll have a dedicated bus line um, uh, just for like a, an hour or two, you know, in the, in the morning rush, in the evening rush, but otherwise we'll be open to general purpose lanes the rest of the time. That's um, highly contested, however. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, the debate... You know, it, it's a great question, and the debate is, um, does that really diminish uh, the performance 
you know, by the standard engineering terms, throughput, speed, et cetera, um, uh, for cars and single occupant vehicles or not. Um, and, and uh, you know, there was some, there's a, there's a lot of contention on Hennepin Avenue, for example, where um, it was shown that uh, the performance of the avenue would, would be very similar to what it is today, even if the, if the bus line were dedicated 24-7, uh, the community, or some members of the community, however, really, really didn't want that to happen. And so the, what prevailed was that decision that had been made was reversed. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, um, the bus line um, for just certain hours of the day will be dedicated um, dur during the rush hour and then um, open up to general purpose for the, the rest of the time. I can't say with authority, maybe other people can, can say how some of the other uh, BRT you know, on these arterial corridors is, are going to operate. But for the most part, I believe, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, for a dedicated uh, purpose for a couple hours and then, you know, then everyone can use those red lanes. Senator Dzyszynski. Okay. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and Senator Dillow, again, just my concern, I think, I think it comes from uh, Senator Newman's. Uh, we always talked about taking lane miles out of service, and I guess that's my frustration. If we're taking lane miles out, that's taking away from the vehicles that could be using that in order of times. So if it's limited and it's, and it's well marked, I guess that makes a little bit more sense. But if we're taking miles out that can be used by the cars, you know, the other 23 hours a day, it would be frustrating for me as a auto owner, I guess, and, and it doesn't affect me that, that much because I don't live in the metro, but we, I travel through it, so uh, to have that limitation would be concerned. Then also on the signaling, and I think Mr. Huser explained it to me a little bit, but uh, I, when I walked across the Capitol the other day and you stand it with light rail and you push that button and it, it seems like you can cross, but it waits and it waits and then light rail overrides and you end up standing there for 10 minutes just to cross over. Would this have the same impact uh, on that issue with the buses? Because again, that gets pretty frustrating when you're standing there waiting. And if you abide by the law, I mean, not a lot of people do. They just <laughs> go across. But uh, it seems like it really th throws off that, that traffic flow of pedestrian traffic. And would this impact that the same way that the light rail does and having to wait extra amount of time if you're just trying to simply cross the street? Senator Dibble. Um, that I hope not. Um, you know, I think the goal of, uh, of signal prioritization and, and creating, you know, the signals that are specific to the buses that hang over their lane. Um, you know, the overarching goal is to make sure that, that the road functions well for all users, whether people are crossing back and forth on foot or traveling up and down um, by whatever means or mode, foot, bike, uh, transit, or, or car. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of very sophisticated um, uh, software now that, that that tries to manage for that. Um, I share your frustration sometimes crossing university back and forth between here and, and the capital. Um, sometimes seems to be, a, doesn't seem to quite make sense for, for pedestrians who are trying to get across. So they, they don't always get it right. Um, I know they did a lot of experimentation with the blue line, the Hiawatha corridor, um, because there was that, that very, very frustrating for folks who are just trying to get across Hiawatha, south of Lake Street in particular. Um, and uh, they did a lot of experimentation and, um, and they, did, they did a pretty good job. You know, those, those trains, you know, except for at the stations, don't, don't stop um, all the way down Hiawatha until, you know, they get to the airport and, and the Mall of America. And uh, being someone who, who does go back and forth across South Minneapolis a lot, I can tell you, um, they, they did a good job, and they, I think they got the balance and the equilibrium pretty good. Senator Jasinski. Then maybe Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, maybe Mr. Shetnan can get that software upgraded across the street here on University so we can go a little bit quicker. But uh, again, that, just my frustration, and, and I would think that the amount of, of bus rapid transit is probably more frequent than light rail, so that could even make it more complicated because I, maybe I'm wrong, maybe, maybe Mr. Shetner or someone can, can comment on the frequency of that and, and what the frequency is out here on University Avenue with light rail. There was, Madam Chair, there was a, a signal prioritization, prioritization study that we did, maybe you're gonna talk about it, um, uh, that we commissioned last year in the bill and the report was sent to us. I'll, I'll resend it to the committee so that we can read it. I don't know that I read it in great detail, so I can't tell you exactly what it said. Maybe Mr. Thompson does. Mr. Thompson. 
Chair and committee members and Senator. Uh, I won't reference that report, uh, but uh, I think that was a good reference there. But I'll just talk a little bit about the difference between signal priority for ABRT and rail. Uh, Blue Line has different priority than Green Line because of the operating environment they're in. Green Line and Blue Line currently operate every 15 minutes each direction. Our uh, goal is eventually to get that back to 10 minute service uh, during certain peak times of the day. The transit signal priority for ABRT is really for to try to um, give a few more seconds to a bus. If it's, it's coordinating with a bus that's either going to go through the intersection to a stop, it, you know, the signal is counting down to change to red. And if it knows there's a bus there and a couple more seconds of green, we'll get that bus through. That's how that signal priority. So it's just minor adjustments that are occurring to keep the flow of the bus. For an ABRT system, the bus, it depends on the route, but uh, the B line, which is currently under construction, will have buses maybe every 10 minutes in each direction uh, during peak time. Uh, that's our high frequency is our goal for ABRT. Um, and then certain times a day, it's maybe 15 minutes uh, if there's less, less demand. So uh, slightly different si signal systems, but it's all modeled based to, uh, as the senator said, to get make it work for all users of the corridor. So the signal timing is adjusted for vehicles, for a lot of pedestrians, and for transit to best move as many people as possible through that corridor. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Senator Jasinski. And thank you, Madam Chair. And then just to follow up, and I apologize, I guess I'm just not as knowledgeable about this as I should be, but so do the buses actually control the lights or is it just a sequencing issue? So, I mean, I know our firefighters and our first responders have a, a basically a button they can change those colors, and I think, I think light rail does as well, but does the buses actually change that or is it just the sequencing between the two lights? If you could expand yeah. on that, let me, maybe all of us could use a little tutorial on how that works. Mr. Chair and, and committee, the uh, emergency vehicles have preemption, so they can override and change the signal for emergency purposes. Uh, that is not the level that we have for transit. Uh, so for buses, they're basically seeing if they can extend the green to make the green last a little bit longer to get through the, through the intersection. Um, it's, so it's more of a, it's a coordination to kind of keep the tra traffic flowing and keep the buses on time. But it's not, it's not gonna say, oh, there's a bus coming, turn it green. It doesn't override like a, like a fire truck or ambulance. It does not have that authority. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Senator Jasinski, are you satisfied? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'm gonna go down that same lane for a little bit because of, as a firefighter, I know the Opticom yep. strobe takes over the intersection, but how does, how does that work because I know that's not the system that you have on a rapid transit bus, so how does that system work, and how does it know it's there? What, is that a radio frequency, or how does that work with the yeah. chair Mr. and Thompson. committee member? It is very similar systems between a, a emergency service. It's a signal from the bus or the train to the controller that is controlling the, the intersection, and that's the same the fire truck does. It's, but then it's the software that decides the priority. So a bus does not have the priority or the override capacity of a fire truck. And so you're, program, you're essentially programming uh, the priority of a vehicle, and, uh, but using the same general technology of communicating between the vehicle and the, the traffic signal controller or computer. Uh, as it's approaching the si signal. So there's a, there is a transmission of co communication that's going back and forth. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I, I understand how the fire truck does it because I've turned the Opticom on and you can see the strobe and you can yep. see the light that gives you the, the signal. Is that the same system or is that a different system for the buses? Because that's where I'm confused right. because I know how the Opticom and the strobe works to take control and I can see... I can sit there and when the th light starts flashing, and I know there's a fire truck coming from a different w direction. I don't see that same thing when I see a bus. Chair, or am I Mr. Missing? Thompson. No, chair, chair and co committee member, you do not, we do not, it's the same concept, but we're not providing that strobe uh, because we're doing, we're not, because that strobe is telling people in the intersection, oh, there's, there's an emergency vehicle coming, there's gonna be a change. Whereas the bus is just signaling, can you extend the green a little bit longer or, or I'm, come, I'm arriving at the intersection. So it doesn't have the same need to send that signal to the surrounding public. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm, I'm gonna 
Good enough. Uh, <laughs> my next question is, is because that rapid transit lane, if, if we're going to do this, and that lane is only going to be used kind of during rush hour traffic, are we still painting the whole thing red? Mr. Thompson. Uh, Chair, we are uh, moving away from solid red for the whole lane. Uh, so it's, there's usually uh, near the intersection or near the trap. Um, it, it sort of depends, but near where the bus stop is. Uh, that lane is often used also as a turn lane for traffic. And so it's for transit and turn lanes. Uh, so, and each, each corridor is unique. Some of our ABRT corridors have no dedicated transit lanes. Uh, the recent ones that the senator mentioned are two of our newer ones that are under construction now, and they have segments that have transit lanes during certain times of the day. But that lane then has other uses. Sometimes it's used for parking, and sometimes it's used for turn lanes. So it's it's really almost block by block what what can use that lane and at what time of day. Senator Howe, satisfied? Uh, thank you, Master, Madam Chair. I guess I, I guess. My only, and when I was thinking you're going to paint that whole lane, in my experience, paint makes it slipperier. It's harder to navigate, and it's just a different texture from the road service. So that was my concern. But thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoff. Members, further discuss. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one last question. Maybe I'm struggling here today with my information, but so a pretty big fiscal note, and I know the amendment probably reduced that amount, but. Where's the money coming from? Is it Met Council or, I mean, it's all 100% comes from Met Council and where are they driving that money from? Senator Debel. Thank you, yeah, I, um, well, given that we have a $2 million one-time target, <laughs> probably not gonna be able to pay for it. So um, yeah, no, uh, I absolutely would envision that this will come from the metro, metro area sales tax. Metro area sales yeah. tax, good. Mr. Marino's objections notwithstanding, Mr. Chetnin's uh, objections notwithstanding, this is how we're gonna have to pay for this. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay, Senator Dibble, before we lay your bill over, do you have any final comments? Uh, just, um, I, I think the thing to, to really hold in our, in our minds, um, the, the thrust, the, the, the major focus of this is, are the accessibility issues uh, for the quadrants that are going to have, have bus rapid transit coming through them. So essential, um, and, that, and that is not in dispute. Um, but it, these things really have to be paid for, and they have to be paid for in a timely way and, uh, and in conjunction with, and they're a part and parcel, of course, making sure that our transit system is as available and accessible to people, particularly those with mobility impairments who, and, and visual impairments who, who need to use transit uh, to get around uh, to what they need to do to have safe, happy, and productive lives. Okay. With that, Senate File 4267, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Moving on to Senate File 1625, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, Senate File 1625 may look familiar to this committee, all except for maybe Senator Bolden, who's, who's not even here. Um, and so, um, uh, Madam Chair and members, as such, um, you have in your packets um, a, a document entitled uh, CE, um, which stands for Committee Engrossment. Now I'm not even finding it, but we made a few uh, technical changes uh, to it last year, um, and so we'll we'll be looking at uh, working off the the committee engrossments. Um, and uh, oh, I see we have an amendment. Is this the Lang amendment? Is there an amendment? Or do we have an amendment? Yes. I don't know that we do, Senator Dibble. Mr. Greenfield. Yeah. Madam Chair and members and Senator Dibble, um, the A4 is being distributed, but it has not been offered. So the uh, A4 amendment would amend the um, committee engrossment that's before uh, this committee. Senator Dibble, is this your this amendment? Is my amendment or is this Senator Lang or Jasinski's amendment? I, I apologize. I, I, I thought I'm, I'm aware Senator there's an Lang. amendment uh, in the works. I don't recall if I had an amendment proposed or not. In, in Madam Chair, I can. Senator Lang, would you like to offer the A4 I sure amendment? Can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd uh, offer the A4 amendment as uh, it's been handed out here, and I, just a little explanation on it is uh, in the spirit of uh, that uh, I love to give MnDOT money. I think more than anything else, this is just a, I don't know if I'd call it uh, a clarification when it comes to that the Commissioner of MMB and the Commissioner of the Transportation uh, 
the Commissioner of Transportation and the Met Council Chair should all get together when they talk about this, uh, whatever project uh, they're going to be working on, and talk about the dollars that exchanged and, and transfer that money to MnDOT, and that's right. the amendment in a whole. Thank you, Senator Lang. Senator Dibble, do you have a comment on the proposed A4 amendment? Um, so, uh, Madam Chair, um, no, I'll, I'll accept the amendment as friendly for the time being. I don't, I don't know that this is exactly, it's in the spirit of how I think we're going to uh, think about this subject because, you know, we're going to hear from the Commissioner of Transportation that this is going to cost, uh, you know, $65 million in this biennium and $163 million. Um, you know, this presumes a lot of things that I think are uh, in error, not, and not an accurate analysis of what the intention is of, of this particular uh, proposal. Um, the proposal would be, of course, uh, just, you know, by high-level summary, the bill would require that the Department of Transportation be the responsible entity for building major construction projects um, of the Met Councils, LRT and the, and the, and the more expensive BRT lines. The reason being, of course, is that I think we now know, and we don't necessarily need to relitigate, although I'm happy to. I have a lot of documentation here um, that shows how uh, the, the better agency to carry out these kinds of major construction responsibilities, the one with the culture, the knowledge, the deep experience, uh, the history of delivering construction projects on time and on budget is the Department of Transportation, contrasted with the Met Council, which has failed in that same task and role. Um, and, and quite profoundly so, and, and rejects uh, any advice. So we have, um, you know, a, a legislative auditor report that shows, you know, in fairly stark terms, um, a lot of findings that show that the Met Council hasn't managed their civil construction contractor, holding them accountable, um, you know, hasn't uh, uh, ca uh, calculated risk for future cost increases, um, uh, very systematically rejected the advice of its independent cost estimator, and, and on and on it goes. Um, and so, um, so the need for the, for the change, I think, is, is quite clear and, and can't be disputed. Um, how it's paid for um, would be similar to how we would pay for any project that the Met Council would be constructed. Southwest LRT has a project office. It's paid for out of project funds. So it would be similarly construed as that. So this, this may or may not get to that, but the, the idea is we're not going to be foisting a bunch of new expense from the general fund or the trunk highway fund or anywhere else onto the Department of Transportation. Um, we're going to ask the Department of Transportation to handle constructing LRT, the more expensive BRT projects, the way the Met Council would today. It's just simply was going to go over and be housed at the Department of Transportation. Um, you know, and I don't know exactly how the blue line was built. and how MnDOT ended up doing that, but they did that. They built the Hiawatha Corridor from downtown out to the Mall of America. Um, and, uh, and that was very successful. They built it, turned it over to the Met Council, and Met Council now owns and operates the Blue Line. So it's very similar in concept to that. So I'll accept the Lang Amendment for the time being. Probably look a little different in a couple of weeks um, as friendly. Okay, members, all in favor of the A4, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, the A4 is adopted. Senator Dibble. So, um, in my convoluted uh, 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 discussion of accepting the Lang Amendment, I think I made the, the points that I was, going, was trying to make. Um, the idea, of course, is to have the MnDOT build uh, future potential LRT lines uh, and some of the more expensive uh, BRT lines, freeway BRT, and some of the, some of the more costly uh, ABRT lines that we anticipate um, because of all the reasons that we've seen, you know, the findings of the legislative auditor, um, the fact that uh, uh, time after time after time on, on a very sy systematic basis, the recommendations of the independent evaluator were rejected um, and uh, change orders became, you know, were just additive and became more and more expensive. Uh, claims of critical path and project uh, delays uh, were just accepted. Uh, and now, through the death of a thousand pinpricks, we now have a project in the form of the Southwest LRT that is hundreds of millions of dollars over, but actually, you know, more than doubled and, and delays of, of a decade or more. Part of that is the uh, uh, inability of the culture of the agency to really receive input from local communities, uh, 
their elected representatives, other stakeholders, people with knowledge, advice, and expertise. Um, you know, because you know of the way the organization is governed. Um, Department of Transportation has a completely different culture. Is able to receive the direction and the advice and the input of the legislature, of the chief executive, um, is, is able to incorporate the advice and the input of local communities and local experts and the like. And so they're able to shape and move projects, manage their, their prime contractors in a way um, that prices the projects correctly, price, you know, acknowledges when change orders truly are change orders, prices them correctly, understands when they have implication for, for schedule, and rejects those instances where they don't, uh, and delivers projects on time and on budget with innovation and responsiveness to local input in a much, much more effective way. So I think that's what the public has come to expect. The Met Council has rejected and actively fought any effort at governance reform. So it's up to us as a legislature to manage these matters on behalf of the public and in the public's interest. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I do have Commissioner Dobbenberger on the testifiers list. Is that to answer questions, or would you like to address the committee? Yes. OK, wonderful. Please come to the testifiers table. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Dobbenberger, and I am honored to serve as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Thank you for allowing MnDOT to testify on Senate File 1625, with which we do have concerns. MnDOT would have challenges delivering the types of projects referenced in this bill. The, the Botno Blue, Blue Line Extension um, and the Riverview Corridor projects are estimated to be over one and two billion dollars respectively. And staffing just one of these projects would require at least 100 MnDOT staff, which is approximately the number of current MnDOT Metro District construction staff today. And since rail projects take years to construct, um, there could be an overlap requiring over a couple hundred people at a time. And as a result, MnDOT would have difficulty delivering other projects in our program, especially now with the Blatnick Bridge funded and moving forward. Even though our Northeastern District is leading the project, it will put additional demand on statewide program delivery staff resources. Also, when local agencies receive funding for projects on state highways, like with the Quarters of Commerce program and congressionally designated spending, a MnDOT takes over the construction contract administration for those projects if they're on the state highway. And then MnDOT continues to be challenged in filling positions in construction. We have more open position than, positions than applicants, and, um, and we have difficulty competing with the Met Council and local agencies for construction employees. And currently, we're down about 20% of our full staff complement in our metro district. The Met Council is the regional planning entity and operator of the transit system and has institutional knowledge related to this. And therefore, the Met Council should manage the construction of their system as MnDOT manages the construction of projects on our system. Uh, MnDOT does not have the institutional knowledge on constructing light rail transit systems, specifically overhead cantonary systems, traction power substations, operating systems, et cetera. And since the Met Council will be the ultimate owner and operator of these systems, they need to accept the work in the field. Without um, them in the field or on these projects, the additional layer of approvals and, um, and going through them res could result in a higher possibility of um, risks related to disputes and delays. And alternatively, a, a couple other approaches that could be considered. Um, a little over a year ago, MnDOT completed a peer review of the Green Line Extension Project and provided recommendations to the Met Council, for which those recommendations could certainly be applied on other projects currently under development. And MnDOT could continue this practice as a peer reviewer on future projects that have not yet gone out for bid. And these major construction projects would benefit from constructability reviews that could be provided by construction contractors. Uh, MnDOT could dedicate additional key staff to work with the Met Council's project leadership team through our existing partnership agreement. 
uh, through that existing agreement, MnDOT already assists the Met Council by providing staff expertise and resources to their projects. And uh, Chair Dibble, I appreciate um, the, the kind words from MnDOT, your confidence in MnDOT for taking over these projects, and we'd be happy to continue to work with you and our partners at the Met Council to further address the concerns. I stand for questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Members, discussion. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Senator Dibble and, and Commissioner Dobber. And that, well, before you came out, those were my concerns. I, th I you know, I like that, and you, uh, Senator Dibble, and myself have the same confidence in MnDOT. But I, I, I started to think about the staffing issues and how you would handle that load, and would that take away from other areas that you're doing now, and other areas of the state as well? Because there's a lot of these big projects in the metro, but in rural Minnesota, we have a lot of projects that are important too. And if we're taking too much staff away from, from that to do these type of projects, I would have some concerns. So I think you addressed my concerns, but I just want to voice that, that you know, we would want to be concerned about uh, taking away what MnDOT is delivering to us in, in Greater Minnesota and Metro uh, to oversee some of these projects, and, and do you have the staff? And I, I know workforce is an issue, and I've heard the shortages already in that, so that would be my concern with the, with the bill, that we'd be putting MnDOT in a tougher position uh, to deliver what they do already. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Others? Okay, Senator Dibble, final word. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, I would share that concern, and that would not be um, the goal of my bill <clears throat> at all. And uh, I appreciate that uh, Commissioner Dobbenberger has, has these concerns and, and has expressed them. And I was, you know, I'm happy to get those concerns out on the table. It's the same concerns we heard last year. There's a way to do this. We're all really smart and really creative. And I, and I have faith in the Department of Transportation um, that we can figure this out so that we can have the Department of Transportation build these massive construction projects that the Met Council cannot do. They are incompetent and incapable of it. They don't have the experience, the culture, they have the record of failure. Just last week, Madam Chair, we got news that yet another big flub where they laid the tracks too close to the freight lines. It's just, it's never ending, it's relentless. Week after week, another failure on this construction project. It is our responsibility as those who are here to look out for the public's interest to make sure that those public dollars are being spent in a way that we would expect, that our constituents would expect. So everything that Commissioner Dobbenberger, completely valid. I know that we have it within our ability to figure out how not to have those kinds of implications for the Department of Transportation. It can be done. It's been done in the past. And it's been done with project dollars, of course. Met Council manages these, these projects with a staff. The staff can be transported over to the Department of Transportation and they receive their funding from now, you know, almost $500 million per year that's going to go into the capital effort for um, this robust package of transit and access and mobility programs that we're going to see happen in the metropolitan area. But the idea that the Met Council is going to receive this amount of money and, and have these many projects in front of them when they cannot do it is more than I can even stand to think about. So this is an important initiative, and, I, and I'm committed uh, to figuring out the issues that have been laid on the table because we really do need to get this done. And I'll go back to um, <clears throat> a point I made earlier, which is the Met Council has vociferously defended its prerogative to be completely beyond the reach of any elected board or body or entity. Active efforts to, to undermine that policy idea. So we're not moving forward with that this year because they've been quite successful. And for better or for worse, the buck doesn't stop with the governor. The governor is so far removed from you know, being able to manage and oversee and, and manage the day-to-day -day activities of essential services that touch the lives of the public every single day. Transit, sewers, housing, uh, and on it goes. Um, and so they, they exist out of view. And, and that's what gives rise to, to all, of this, all of these problems. And so we have an agency here who does a fantastic job, innovates, delivers on time, delivers on budget, manages their prime contractors, understands how to be a really tough and, and capable negotiator. Um, and so I think we have a really good idea here in front of us. We have some problems to solve. We can do that 
And so with that, I would uh, um, encourage us to lay the bill on the table as amended uh, for further consideration and come back to it in a couple of weeks when we have an omnibus bill in front of us. Thank you, Senator Dibble. So with that, Senate File 1625 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, before we adjourn, Ms. Ethier, is there anything we should know about? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. The committee will be meeting next Monday evening. We are planning on a slightly extended, I mean, this was an unplanned extended hearing. So we'll be hearing um, a number of bills that require me staying a little bit late, um, and that agenda will be posted tomorrow. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>